Well, welcome everyone. Uh, welcome to the Town of Deerfield Select Board Board of Health uh, and Sewer Commissioners meeting. Um, this is October 19th, 2022. It is uh, 6 10 p.m. Uh, we are uh, we're having a hybrid meeting, which is uh, on Zoom and also in the main meeting room at 8 Conway Street, South Deerfield, Mass. Uh, this meeting is, is being held, will be held in a hybrid fashion with the opportunity for both in person attendance and remote participation in accordance with the Chapter 107 of the Acts of 2022, which extended the governor's March 12th, 2020 order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, Mass General Law, Chapter 30A, Section 20, until March 31st, 2023. Please note that while an option for remote participation and or attendance is uh, being provided as a courtesy to the public, the meeting or hearing will not be suspended or terminated if technical uh, technological uh, problems interrupt the virtual broadcast unless otherwise required by law. Members of the public with particular interest in any specific item on this agenda should make plans for in-person virtu versus virtual attendance accordingly. For purposes of in-person attendance, the town of Deerfield will host the meeting in the main meeting room um, of the Deerfield Municipal Offices. The remote participation information is listed on our agenda, which can be found on the town of Deerfield's website. Bottom, uh, bottom section is the uh, calendar. You can click on this meeting. There's a link um, to that. You'll see a link to the Zoom meeting. Um, people uh, watching on FCAT, because it's also broadcast on FCAT, can use a toll-free number if they'd like to, to dial in. It's 833-548-0276. Um, the meeting ID is 911-604-1580. Should you need a passcode, it's 570012. If you're um, on Zoom or on landlines, please um, mute until asking questions or called upon and just state your name. Um, you can mute your phone for landlines by hitting star six and unmute by hitting star six. Um, and we have a lot of people in the audience. Thank you all for coming tonight. Um, when, when there's time for public comment on, on items, please come up to the table. You know, state your name and speak into the mic so people at home can hear you and um, we can all hear you. So I'll call the meeting to order. Um, our first items are um, public comment. So if anyone would like to make a public comment, what I'm going to do tonight, um, because it is a full agenda with a lot of things that people want to talk about, um, we're foregoing the two two minute, um, you know, public comment and we're um, going to take public comment on the items when we're talking on them. So we'll open a hearing and then we'll, we'll, the whole idea is to get your input. I mean, that's what we're here for. And so we'll listen to you. And I think if, if something's said over and over and again, we'll, we'll move on. But, um, but generally we want to hear what people have to say and, um, and have you all hear what we have to say. So um, I'm going to read another blurb, <laughs> bear with me with all this, but I'm going to open the hearing for the select board uh, sewer commissioners um, notice of public hearing pursuant to general law chapter 83, the Deerfield general bylaw chapter 150 sewers, the Deerfield select board board of health acting as sewer commissioners will hold a public hearing on October 19th, 2022 at 6 p.m. The sewer commissioners uh, propose an amendment to the sanitary sewer systems bylaw by deleting the article in its entirety and replacing it with uh, section subsection uh, 105-1 title and authority comma 150-2 purpose comma 150-3 definitions comma 150-4 Deerfield sewer district map comma 150-5 changes to district map comma 150-6 boundaries of districts comma 150-7 uh, interpretation Chapter 150-8, application, comma 150-9 is the Board of Sewer Commissioners. Chapter 150-10 is management and budgeting. Chapter 150-11, protection from damage. Chapter 150-1, uh, power and authority of inspectors, uh, comma 150-13, safety, indemnification. Chapter, uh, let's see, 150-14, right of entry, 150-15, violations and penalties, 150-16, severability, uh, and to discuss a proposed amendment to the 
to the 1935 Acts uh, 343 special legislation. The Deerfield Board of Health uh, proposes repeal of the Deerfield General Bylaws Chapter 236, comma, sewer, uh, parentheses sewers upon adoption and approval of the aforementioned amendment to Chapter 150 sewers. Uh, the full text is on file for public review at the municipal offices during business hours has been or at um, the town of Deerfield website www.deerfieldma.us. So and all the uh, rest of this blurb is the same meeting information that um, I've read out in the main meeting so you can find us same way same meeting number same toll free number so um, I've opened the hearing. And. Um, there are handouts here, so if people want to come up and um, get any kind of information that you'd like, we've got information on um, the special town meeting info session that we'll hold after, and really we have some information on, on sewer and bylaws on the bottom left uh, corner of the, of the item. So, um, so generally, um, what, what we're doing is looking at changing a few things and bringing, bringing some things up to speed. Everybody knows we have worked um, hard on upgrading our sewer system. We're in the midst of um, a large project at the South Deerfield Wastewater Treatment Plant and have invested quite a bit in that and it's coming along very well. Um, but um, in looking at that and looking at how our, how our um, we really need to update our, our, our regulations. You know, we have uh, we have thin bylaws on sewer. The act was done in 1935 before we had even had any uh, treatment plants. Um, and there's things that you know there are probably laws governing sewers now that weren't in effect in 1935. So we thought the idea would be to um, to update these. Um, there's some discussion on different things that we might want to change, um, and then. Uh, we would like to adopt our um, a, a new set of bylaws and then and then repeal kind of a um, when we when I think the town adopted some of our bylaws they adopted it through the board of health and really it needs to be through the board of uh, selectmen acting as the sewer commissioners so we're cleaning up a lot of that language and then provided this passes at annual town meeting we'll be working hard on in the next month or so the um, and we've already begun working on the regulations which will which will govern all kinds of things, you know, um, how people work on our sewer system, what kind of materials go in the ground, you know, what what rules and regulations the contractors need to work on, you know, um, how you hook up to the sewer, a lot of different things that we're working on with our um, with our <coughs> consultants and, and engineers to kind of get that that up to speed. So, um, so we have potential changes. Um, to Article 15, uh, Amendment to the Chapter uh, 343, the Acts of 1935. Um, so first we want to talk about the bylaw, then the Acts, and then re uh, repeal of 236. Do you want to add anything, Tim, to any of um, this? Or? I, yeah, I'd want to share a little bit of information. Currently, the, um, the Chapter 150 bylaw that exists for the town is one paragraph long. And chapter 230, uh, 236 is mm -hmm. essentially what we want to replace with regulations. And the purpose of that is that the regulations will be written and reviewed by both a legal team and an engineering team. And it, it's really more of an engineering document. And it's tied to state statutes about um, the sewer system. A lot of it is referring directly to state statutes. So as state statutes change, these new regulations, which we would adopt after a series of public hearings to get input from the public, um, would allow them to be flexible. So we wouldn't have to come back and change them every time a statute changes. Uh, currently, because it's enshrined in a bylaw, um, if there's a conflict with the state rules and what the bylaw says, uh, you have to go in and have a special meeting and, and do that. So it's, um, We've done this in the past uh, with other bylaws to try and build in the capability of the bylaw to live when the state law changes. So that's a major factor in why um, it makes sense to look at repealing chapter 236. And um, the, other, uh, the other fleshing out of, of the bylaw for 150 is to specify how um, 
future sewer projects, not the South Deer for the wastewater treatment plant, which is already behind us and all the rules that have been in place for paying for it, et cetera, still exist. But any future projects, it would spell out the rules that govern who gets assessed, who pays for it, if it's a small portion of, of the town, you know, would they would be responsible for paying, so on and so forth. Uh, and also um, fleshing it out and modernizing it because one paragraph is not sufficient to to the time period that we're living in. Mm -hmm. And and to have that flexibility to to make changes to regulation as as things change, phosphorus. You know, there's all kinds of things that change, and have to come back to it. Change a bylaw every time you want to uh, change a small part of the regulation. A lot more difficult to do. Um, so. Um, I, do you, do you have anything you want to add to it, or? No, you, I think you both summed it up pretty clearly. Um, let's see. I you know really the uh, so again the first is um, is deleting Article Two, Section One Hundred and Fifty in its entirety and replaced with the following. And those were the headlines that I wrote in the I read in the um, in the Act. I it's all on a printout here too. If anyone has a comment on any of the title and authority, purpose, definitions. Um, you know, the sewer, sewer, uh, Deerfield sewer districts, which we still have one district, you know, we have two plants and we manage two plants, um, but everything is under one umbrella. We do, we do all the work together. Um, and let's see, and then there's, um, the map, which just kind of, there was a map from 1970, I think that had our kind of layout and that was right before I think the plants went in, I, I believe the EPA really and the federal government funded a lot of the, you know, big portion of the plants that went in. And I think at that time they had made maps back in 2019 before we came before you and asked for the $19 million appropriation to start on the South Deerfield plant. Um, we, um, you know, we, we had an asset management plan done. So we took a photo of every manhole. We ran cameras through every single pipe we laid out all of our infrastructure. And so the maps that are in the handouts and in the warrant, you know, for the um, for annual town meeting have the different sections and kind of lay out how the pipes are laid out. So um, that's gonna kind of supersede one of the old master plan sewage system map. Um, so it's really just bringing our stuff up to speed. We really haven't, we haven't done due diligence to really get on bringing our act up, up you know, up to current and making sure that we have, you know, a thick set of regulations that really manage our system and, and allow um, contractors who work on it to know what, what's required and people who hook up to it to know what's required. So that's really the gist of this. There, um, I guess I'll get to the elephant in the room, which is um, back in 19, and, and the way we paid for, for um, so, so how we pay for our, sewer system is that we have sewer user fees, right? And those are everybody that's hooked onto it. We set a rate each year um, and it's based on the water usage that people use. Um, in the winter time, you kind of pay for all the usage you have. And in the summertime, you only pay hundred, um, no more than 125% of what your previous winter usage was, was because we know you water your lawns and do the garden and all that kind of thing. So, um, so that's kind of how that's funded. And then and that's paid for by the sewer users to uh, operate the system and do repairs and that kind of thing, small maintenance. Um, when we get into large capital um, in 1935, when, when we developed this a sewer system or, or really laying pipes, we had no, this all just went to the river or streams at the time. Um, but it was in 1935, the town uh, asked legislation from the state and the law was that 25% of any capital cost would be borne by the general fund, which is everybody in town, um, and 75% would be borne by the, the users. And, and the reason for that, and we had discussions a lot in 2019 when we passed the large appropriation, and that was for making sure that we had, um, you know, that the town does have, even though, say, I'm on a, a septic system and um, the town's not coming to fix or maintain my septic system, but really uh, as a town, as a whole, we, we gain benefit from having a, a sewer infrastructure system. We do have 
um, industry and businesses that come to town. We're allowed a lot more dense population. So we're allowed a downtown where houses can be right next to each other and they don't have to have space for a raised system or a, or a leach field. Um, so so only, and, and we have municipal buildings and schools and all of that um, are hooked in. So, and you really wouldn't have a town without really not a large enough town where we have growth and industrial without a sewer system. So there, so there is some buy-in, I think, from a town to have a portion of say in um, any capital projects that we do. Um, there was a lot of give and take on that, but the town kind of kind of uh, agreed to that, of course, in 1935, and agreed again in 2019 when we did that. Um, we we have to begin working on. Um, the other Deerfield plant too. Um, we're all trying to figure out how how best to pay for this, um, and working with nonprofits that want to be a part of this as well. So we've been looking at different ways to. Um, if this is coming up for a change, how do we want to change that? And there's <clears> been, <throat> I guess, just dis, you know, disagreement and agreement. We've been all hashing through different ideas that have been out there, and that, I think that's the elephant in the room. Are we? You know, getting rid of um, that 25-75 split, or are we changing that? Um, there's been pros and cons to each of that. How we go about paying for, you know, a, a, you know, upgrades on a plant that's really um, mostly run, you know, and used by by nonprofits, so they don't pay in that portion of of tax, the 25%. So we're trying to figure out ways to to do that. I think, you know. I know in speaking with, with the nonprofits, they want to be a big part of the um, sharing in the cost. I mean, they're, they're funding our South Deerfield plant because, again, we're one district. When they pay their sewer bill, they're paying the debt service on the South Deerfield plant, even though they're not hooked up to that. So there's a, there's a sharing. We are a town. We're all one, one entity and that, that need to help each other work through these you know large expenses all while we go out to state and federal you know entities to um rattle for money that we need to to do these projects so that was really the genesis of the discussion of how do we set that up and um and so updating our bylaws would allow us to do betterment charges instead of changing the rates or vice versa or both um so we're, we're here to kind of hear from the public a bit on your feelings about this and have you hear from us about what are our ideas? Um, I think one thing that I wanted to talk about, because again, the elephant in the room is the 25-75 split. And Trevor, could I just interrupt oh, please, for a second? Yes, go I ahead. just wanted to uh, just correct a nuance. The, the 19, 1935 Act actually said that the town will pay no less than 25% right. and no more than 66%. Thank you. And um, so, at the time, the 66% probably made a lot of sense because there were no pipes in the ground. And so creating a system that would help um, the residences deal with you know, effluent from their homes made a lot of sense. Um, now we have two mature plants yep. and um, the users that are on the systems are easily defined. And, and so, Interestingly enough, if you divide the cost of the South Deerfield plant by the number of users on it, it works out to just about the amount of money that you used to pay to have a leach field septic system put in. It's like $21,000. So that's a coincidence probably, but uh, I know that any of us who are on septic systems, private septic systems, you know, know that if ours goes down, we, we have to go out and find the 20 to 25 to $30,000 to fix it. So um, I just wanted so that's to- That's a great point. It, yeah. it is because, it, yeah, right, as you're building this. Yeah, and so, you know, the, the sewer plant that's almost complete is basically providing the same thing that a septic system user would, would have to look, the expense would have to look for. So it, it's an expensive thing for all people who are tied into the sewer. Mm, it is. And, and <clears throat> you know, as with building anything nowadays, the, the rates are going up and the and the um, cost of construction is is skyrocketed immensely as you know other topics we'll have on the warrant too but i think um but i think there is um you know it's important that we invest in our systems um we need to we need to make sure that we're a viable town for businesses that are coming we have a you know an 18 million dollar plus investment going into the you know the old pickle factory we had another huge uh, investment. So we have getting manufacturing and people coming to, to town and wanting to 
um, to live here and bring business here and work here because we have a system that can support that. Um, so really, um, I, I, I'll go a little bit on this and then what we can take comment. So there was some discussion about um, using Casey as our, our channel. Um, we've been sending ideas back and forth on this and, and hearing from the public on what their concerns were. If we, if we remove that, that percentage and the idea originally was like, okay, well, let's get rid of that 2575. And then each time we have a project, let's, let's decide as whoever's sitting in these seats, it doesn't always going to, it's not always going to be us come up with a, a plan to fix it and, and justify what percentage the town should pay in on any specific project. And of course, that's just our idea. We take it to you, the public, you're the residents, you decide, do we think this is a, the right amount that the town should pay in zero, you know, anywhere from 1% to 50% or whatever you wanted to do. Um, some people had concern that, you know, at some point, 20 years down the road, maybe everybody asked for 50% uh, of town usage and, and it might cause a lot of consternation about who, who should be paying, who shouldn't be paying. I think what's in, in there now is, is really close to fair and, um, and it, it, um, it is kind of set, it's set precedent, but, um, you know, I'm not stuck on 25%. It could be 20%. It could be 15. It could, you know, it, I, I do think that there's a value and I think there's a responsibility for the town general fund to pay some, but um, to be a catalyst to do this work and, 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 you know, get our, gain our benefit from it. But I, but I, you know, most of it should be the sewer users because that's who typically use it. Um, Can so, I chime in oh, here too? Of course. Yep. Um, so as I said, the current law and, and what everybody voted on to finance the South Deerfield water, wastewater treatment facility re renovation, that stands. No matter what we do tonight, mm -hmm. that stands. So that plant has got a 40-year lifespan, and we've got 40 years of debt service on it. Um, the difference between the South Deerfield district, in my mind, and the old Deerfield district is that there are no municipal structures. and you, you might consider that the old Deerfield uh, fire fire department is a, a municipal function. Everything else down there, with the exception of the post office, is a private enterprise um, or a residence or a nonprofit. And so there's, in my mind, little or no justification for the town to pay 25% of any repair cost. Um, and so this change would allow us to say, is it 1%, is it 2%, is it no percent, or is it 20%? Um, if we don't change it, we are guaranteed to spend 25% of tax dollars to fix a plant that largely goes to nonprofits. And um, it's been a challenge for all of us to pay for the existing plant that we do gain benefit from or are tied into as users. So it, it, if we don't make this change, then we're guaranteed to pay for 75% of the cost or 25% of the cost of that plant if we repair it. Now, I'm working closely with the nonprofits and, and I'm the liaison for the old Deerfield plant. Um, and we are working cooperatively with the nonprofits. In fact, we will be engaging with them in the next coming weeks to listen to some proposals they have about uh, designing and or paying for the plant. So I'm optimistic that we can reach an agreement that's good for everyone. And, but on the other hand, if no agreement is reached, I wanna protect the taxpayers of town by saying we can have the option to apply $0 to the plant. And the bylaws, the 150 bylaws spell out um, a procedure where you can apply betterment. So for instance, if um, company A gets 45% of the, better, the, the benefit of a plant, you can ask them to pay 45% of the cost of the plant. Uh, if if uh, you know, resident gets 1% of the, or 0.5% of the benefit, you can ask them to pay for 0.5 of the cost of the plant. Um, currently, it's all buried in a user fee, which is what all of the sewer users in town are, are experiencing. They're paying both for the, the cost of fixing the plant and they're paying their user fee in one, one monthly or I don't mm -hmm. know if it's monthly or quarterly payment. 
Um, so this is a probably a far more equitable way to deal with the situation where you have, you know, large institutions being the main beneficiaries and and they're uh, assigning the cost, their portion of the cost of this. Now, this wouldn't be decided by three of us as sewer commissioners. We would hire um, a professional engineering firm to say, this is what the benefits to these various entities are. And, um, and in the same way, we, we would have them give us advice on sewer regulations because we're not experts on any of this. Uh, you know, Trevor is the most expert because he's been living the sewer for the last three years, pretty much. But uh, so that's the context. Yep. So there were several options. Um, one was, um, you know, that we we change the we either do do nothing, we get we get rid of it completely, or um, we we say no more than twenty percent uh, of of the of the charge um, would be borne by the users. Or we got a hand up. Oh, great. Well, let's hear some questions. Might as well. We've talked long enough. <laughs> Jack, uh, Jack, come on up and uh, state your name and use the mic so people at home can hear you. Welcome. My name is John Petrarch. I live at 50 Sugar Loaf Street, South Fairfield. That one's better. My, yeah. my concern is this. When I read the law, the Article 15 changeover, and you've pretty well explained it so far. How do I know it's guaranteed that you're going to pay it 25%? Trevor? At least the first is that, is that working? Is the mic working? He's in the mic. Okay. Make sure that works. So John, just to recap, just to recap for John, he wants to make sure that the this is not going to change what is happening in the South Deerfield project. Is that true? That's that that's what I'm looking for. I want to I want to know how you're going to guarantee already, you've it's, it's been said by two people already that the project that we've already voted, we've already agreed that you're gonna pay 25% as a town father, correction, father and mother. Thank you. And I wanna make sure that this is codified somehow in a law. As far as future things, and I totally agree with you that Old Deerfield is very unique and requires certain changes. And I agree with that change if that's what the issue is. But how do we know that this is guaranteed that you agree that you're going to pay to 25% for the next 40 years? Uh, yeah, and I, I know definitely because, um, right, I don't have that answer. We have, that's a, that's a good question we, we would ask. I don't know, Casey, is Lisa on? I don't know if she was gonna join us. Uh, she was hoping to join us, our attorney as well, but um, we can't change anything because of USDA and, and the way that we've done our, our loans. Um, so, you know, if we made something like that, USDA could call the note right away. So we, we really have to stay with this, the structure we have right now to pay for what so we're doing. So is that written into the USDA in, yes. paperwork yes. that the town is responsible for 25%? Yeah, the way we have our, our, our structure is set up. They look, you know, deeply at, you know, how the sewer users pay and how the town pays in. And, Okay, because I was going to make a big sales pitch to try and kill this article, <laughs> because reading it the way it says, it's not good for the sewer users, and it's not good for the anti-sewer users either, mm -hmm. because you could turn around and have a board of selectmen now that says, well, I'm going to change it so that you have to divert 24% and add it on to the sewer user fee, mm -hmm. but then 10 years from now, you could have three people on the sewer system says, well, I'm going to make up for the idea that you made me pay this thing for 10 years, mm -hmm. and now I'm going to turn around and make the town pay 50%. So I don't want to divide the town. Right. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm trying to do. I want to make this simple, okay. common sense, and based on what, what right. you... What would the complexity be? I, I understand that. And, and, and a guarantee on the pass. Carolyn? Carolyn, can you speak into the microphone, please? She's just about eating it. Jonathan, <laughs> Are those are those up, Jonathan? I, I am a talk right into the microphone. Now it's, yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. What what we were one of the things we had thrown out was up to twenty percent, John, for future projects. 
but we would have the flexibility of, of coming up with the exact percentage. And then of course you have to go to town meeting to get vote. Right. And then if it's a debt exclusion, cause most projects are pretty big, yeah. then it has to go to a ballot. So there would be two checks on whatever percentage we came up with, but saying up to 20%, I, I feel like I would want that kind of flexibility. Um, because, you know, if the piping, we don't know what the projects could be in the future. The whole idea is to get these two plants up and running and, and um, fixed so that we don't have to deal with it for 40 more years. But any project beyond the South Deerfield right now, piping, whatever, we would have the flexibility up to 20%. I, I, I mean, that's what I'm advocating for, not the 25% to 66%. Mm -hmm. I, I, I feel like that's I think that 25 to 66% was in there excessive. because right. the, the Board of Health promulgated by the state and the state required a minimum contribution of 25 up to 67%. Right. right. And that was during the period of time when the system was being developed. Yeah. Uh, yeah. As I say, we have a mature system at this point. Um, and the key thing that I think everyone should bear in mind is the first words of the Article 135, or, or, I mean, Chapter 343 of the Acts of 1935, the town shall by vote. So right. it doesn't matter what three people say or six people at the sewer commission is the select order if it's separated, a plan is presented to the voters and the voters decide. So if we go to the, the voters and they say, wait a minute, um, there's not 20% of value in fixing this plant to the rest of the town. It, 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 there's really only 10. The voters decide, and that's the beauty of the system we operate in is that the voters decide on expenditures. So I agree that it's, um, I believe that the documents for the South, the South Deerfield plant, the USD, USDA loan, they examined what is the payment mechanism for this? And it's clearly specified in there, mm -hmm. but. But I definitely but, yeah. agree with you yeah. that we should, we should get Lisa to Lisa Mead's firm to you know, clarify like this for us. And if we don't have that that guarantee, we should certainly put it in. Mm -hmm. Well, I would want to make sure that that's the case because if you take a look from 1935 till now, you take a look at all the construction. It's all in South Deerfield. It's all commercial. It's right. all help. If you take a look at the taxes that are generated from the industrial park. We stole a couple of companies from Greenfield, mm -hmm. Channing Beat, and the uh, Millis Falls Tool. So right now in one area, we bring in $340,000 worth of taxes. Yankee Candle alone with their operations all over the place, they bring in over a half million dollars to the town. And these are the benefits that you get from having a sewer system. Mm -hmm. So the town benefits, whether you live in East Deerfield, West Deerfield, or South Deerfield, the town benefits. The other point I was going to make is that being a sewer user, I'll pay 75%, but my 75% may be closer to 80 or 85% because right. I'm also a taxpayer. I'm part of two groups. Right. One's a sewer user and the other is a taxable entity within the town of Deerfield. Mm -hmm. That's correct. But I, I think you will also agree, John, that it's in, very important to have some flexibility at this point. I agree. Okay. I agree. That's and why I'm, I'm satisfied. You've answered all my questions already before I even got a chance to speak. So thank that's you. So that's the goal. Okay. You prep yeah. as well. Um, Jeff, up to, yeah, welcome. Good evening, uh, Jeff Upton, Hillcrest Ave. And uh, I agree with everything that John had mentioned. And also thank you for the clarification. Uh, obviously, I was in the other night yes. and had several questions for you, and uh, you covered most of them, to be honest. Uh, just to clarify one other point, though, that I just want to make sure people understand. If I'm not, uh, let me see, recollection here, I believe, I just want to remind people that I think Yankee Candle and Channel B paid for their own sewer to but have it installed they, they, they to extended. hook up. Fortunately, yeah. the yeah. town wasn't, you know, existing, so they could hook up, yeah. but they did pay for their own yes. systems. But, okay, the other question I had, and it goes back to the other night, and I'm just wondering if you have any clarification on that, maybe from uh, Lisa, was the 150 
dash 10.5 in the last sentence, the last sentence in, in that paragraph. And that's about the, uh, as far as method of payment for town and sewer users and so on and so forth. And that last sentence after it goes through the whole paragraph and establishes how that's going to play out, it states, however, in the event the act is amended, then this provision shall be of no further effect in the act shall control. And I'm I'm wondering if we end up with any clarification on that because that's a little yes, confusion. I, I, I confusing, I think, for most people, including mm -hmm. myself. I'm not a lawyer. Yeah, exactly. Jeff came and uh, talked with us about some of these things. I don't remember which night it was, but recently, and, and he brought up a good point. So I, I brought his question to Lisa Mead. And um, in fact, what the last sentence means is in the event that we modify the acts of 1935 and we change the percentage, um, 150-10.5 will disappear. It will be not in the document because if you read the first part of 150-10.5, of it basically um, spells out this 25-75 um, split. Uh, and that's because I think it's actually wrong. It should be 66%, but um, I'll ask Lisa about that as well. Um, but basically, um, the act would be changed. So what's in the act governs, and this would just disappear entirely. Yeah. So does that mean we'd have to come up with new language? As far um, as based on the change, you may have to change this percentage, and I'm going to in the act. Yeah, I in the, in that the actual language that's here in 150 10.5, it says, let me read it so that um, I, I may have misspoke, but I don't think so. For the payment of the estimated and or final co capital costs attributable to the construction of each sewer system service area, such betterments shall not in aggregate exceed 75% of the capital cost of such system. So no, this is correct. So what that means is we are currently, the act requires the town, wherever the sewer is, whoever the users are, whether there's a benefit to the town or not, um, to pay 25%. So this says that betterment charges cannot exceed 75%, meaning we can't say um, that user A has to pay 70, you know, more than 75% as a betterment. But if the act, is amended so that we can save zero to 20 or zero to 25 percent then this whole paragraph will disappear hmm. because it is confusing otherwise if you leave the paragraph it it's, it's a conflict in what what the uh all right it's always because you never know how the votes yeah. will go you got to have both yeah ready to go yeah exactly yeah. that's why i say it's a, it's a little confusing and mm -hmm. and once again you know nothing towards the present members of this board, but we all know uh, committees change per, you know, personnel. Mm -hmm. And sure. then all of a sudden you're left with just the language interpretation. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the intent and purpose gets lost. And I guess that's my only concern about this as far as, as, no, as I we're... understand completely uh, what, what you're trying to establish and accomplish. I mm -hmm. understand that completely. Yeah. I'm just a little nervous about some of the language. Sure. And, and so thank you. That was a good thing to bring up and, and I'm glad we could get clarification about it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate and, that. and we will get a guarantee on the 40 year project of South Deerfield not being able to change. I yeah, mean, we were was... told that it's not, but right. That we'll, was the other we'll question I had kind the other of, night. We'll get some kind of guarantee from okay. Lisa that is you know, I, I think more... that would put a lot of people at ease. Mm -hmm. yeah. little... That's great. Yeah. Yeah. Thank and, you. And that's certainly our intention as Skip. well. And while Skip's coming up to the mic, I also would like to mention that although we want to work on this old Deerfield plant and get it to current stand standards, it currently functions. So there's a, there's a period of time between now and five years from now, 10 years from now, where we want to accomplish that but it's not like the plant is not, you know, a, a performing and, and meeting meeting standards, um, you know. Most of the time. But it's we're <laughs> we're in risk, obviously. It we is, are in risk. Yeah. yeah and so, sure. 
we're using this this time where we're still blessed with the plant working to try and come up with a solution that limits the amount of uh, limits or eliminates the amount of money the average the taxpayers will have to pay to fix this plant that largely does not um, benefit taxpayers. There, there's no in, no real industry down there. There's one store that's tied into this this south the old Deerfield plant, and that's the convenience store, as far as I understand. Skip, Skip, excuse me. Skip Olmstead, Stillwater Road. <clears throat> I was hoping that Jeff would bring this up, but since he didn't, I will. Back three years ago or four years ago, we first started this discussion of redoing these plants in the South Deerfield plant. Uh, that question, thanks to Jack's research, uh, we found out that taxpayers in the town would have to pay a proportion of the uh, cost of the plant. And uh, that included all taxpayers, including, including myself, and actually the three of you who are on septic systems. Uh, the issue that we have is we have to pump those systems uh, every few years and there's a cost to the pumping and then at a cost of the disposal of the waste. Uh, and we did talk about creating some ability to uh, dispose of the waste in town. We can't do that. South Deerfield plant will not accept the waste or the, you know, they have no place to put it, but I don't know, maybe if they did, they still wouldn't take, it. I don't know. But uh, somewhere along the way, it was my understanding uh, based on the conversations that that was going to happen. <clears throat> and so far it has not. And I, you know, I didn't see anything in writing yeah. Uh, but I maybe the time is now to put it in writing. It would be seems well, we, to me it would make some sense to do that and give us the ability to we, disposal. We have always supported that, but we had to come in with as um, I don't want to say inexpensive because it certainly was extremely expensive. But we had to come in within budget, and that was one of the things that was cut. Um, our intention is to try to get it. Um, in the old Deerfield plant when that is um, designed. And the reason why it makes more sense in the old Deerfield plant is because the usage of that plant is a school year kind of thing. It seems mm -hmm. to be the most. And the pumping season, although you pump in the spring and the fall, you would pump in the summer as well. And so there would be um, the ability to treat that in a and make it more even flow kind of thing. So we're hoping that that is how we're going to um, direct the cost. And, and, and Trevor, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I think that one of the issues in now with the South Deerfield plant, adding this at, the, at this time would be difficult, but with the old Deerfield plant, you could actually integrate it into the planning from the outset. Mm -hmm. And I guess one of the issues is that the concentration of pumped yes. uh, se septic is different than when it's flowing through a pipe, right. and so they have to they have to build a facility that can dilute the the pumped um, effluent and and get it into the same consistency that what would be flowing out of a sewer pipe would be. So uh, that's one of the things that we definitely want to try and aim for at the old Deerfield plant because it would be um, a great benefit to septic system users. I mean, that we did have something similar to that to some extent when Oxford Pickle was here. They, because of their, the waste that they put out and the concentrations, and I don't know, the acid concentrations, mm -hmm. whatever it was, mm -hmm. that they had some ability to pre treat, pre -treat. to either well, pre treat was, and then release. Yep. Uh, yep. So we need the space the tanks to do that. Right. Yeah. Right. In any event, my purpose okay. was to, to make sure that everyone heard this and then to twist your arms to make sure that this happens. It's all dollars and cents. I mean, we can do it if people want to pay for it. So it's, it's people you know, want to pay for it. All right. Well, mm -hmm. do I, they? <laughs> I'm, Skip, I'm just saying that we're going to try to do that because one of my big things is we need the potential to um, the reason why I think it will work more is because one of the problems with the um, climate change is you have longer drought periods and more intense rain events. And what happens is the Deerfield River 
is, is very low in the summer sometimes, like this summer when it was drought period. So the idea is to have holding tanks to be clim more climate resilient. You would have holding tanks and you would release when the dams are releasing so you don't um, have permit issues. So the idea is you could come in as a sewer user, you, you know, and have your effluent, um, you know, dumped because we have the ability, would have the ability to have some storage and it can be diluted to the level that um, would come in a pipe and then it would be released when you have, you know, it's been treated and you release it for the, um, you know, when the dams are releasing. So you would have storage capacity that we would not have down at um, well, I just let me sort of disagree because someplace along the way, it all ends up in the deer, in the Connecticut River very shortly after it's released, including oh, the old deer. No, no what I'm talking about. Well, I know what you're talking about, but okay. it's still going to release into the Connecticut River. Mm -hmm. No, it is getting released in the Connecticut River, but you can't, when the river is so low and you're releasing our water, you have permit issues at the old Deerfield plant. So when the dams are releasing, you then have the level that you can release into. So it is a storage issue and we're hoping to mm -hmm. take advantage of that storage issue by having the ability to take individual septic systems. This will be part of the design discussion that Tim is working on and that we are working on with the nonprofits. And my hope is that a, a secondary benefit of this, if, if in fact the, the old Deerfield plant is uh, incorporates this technology is that Deerfield residents would get a, a reduced price for, um, or, you know, discover what the price would be, I don't know, but the intent would be to give Deerfield users, aseptic users, a benefit. And um, and then perhaps it can create a revenue stream by saying, okay, if other towns are having the same problem, finding an affordable way to to get rid of uh, you know septic system pumps. So maybe uh, other communities in, in the neighborhood would would pay in to use that that system. So it would create some revenue uh, to put into the enterprise fund for making sure the plant is repairable in the future. Any other Thank questions? you. One more, uh, Julie, and then then Jeff and Bruce. Welcome. Hi, Julie Chalpont, South Mill River Road. Um, I have a very quick question. I've heard a couple of you have mentioned an upper limit, up to twenty percent, up to twenty five percent. There's nothing written in the standard in the the document right now that Correct. puts an upper limit. Is your intent to change yes. that between yes. now and town meeting? Yes. I yes. mean, the, the idea was to kind of discuss Actually, that yeah. here from people, and then we have some language pre kind of written that we would decide on through this hearing. I'm, I'm, I'm one that had is promoting the 20% versus the 25 to 66% that we have currently. Your question is where, okay. where's the beef? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm actually, I, I would encourage 25% um, mm -hmm. because I can, I can see that there could be a situation where the town wanted, not wanted, it was warranted that the town would pay more. I, I can't come up with a great example, but mm -hmm. say we build and we want to build a new industrial park, but there's nobody in it yet or so. I don't right. know. Yeah. I'm making stuff up, but there could be situations well, that where was, the town I mean, that would decide was, that they wanted to. That was part of the discussion. What are we using as a percentage? Yeah. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Jeff, you have another comment? In fact, we want to decide what that percentage is tonight so we can put it on the warrant and let people see the warrant as we intend it to be. So yeah. um, hopefully we'll get some good input and we can make a decision tonight. <laughs> okay, John, thank you. Uh, I'm glad that's being discussed because that was one of my concerns the other night. I would hate to see uh, where we have to bring this issue to town meeting year after year after year and pit sewer users against septic users. If you had something set, fixed, it mm -hmm. would eliminate that and it would help the town heal a little bit and get yeah. along a little bit. The other issue I have is uh, what Skip referred to as far as this uh, storage tank and being able to have a place for septic users to dump. 
Uh, I hope that is not going to be treated as a standalone project. I talked to David Prickett mm -hmm. uh, years ago, and he said that that could be included in the design. It didn't happen with the South Deerfield plant. Hopefully it's included in the old Deerfield plant. So once again, it's part of the larger project and it's not a standalone mm -hmm. where it could get decisive right. with the population. That's yep. my concern. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Is, is there anyone on the Zoom that is interested in yeah, I don't see any, any hands comments? There I don't see any hands, yeah. but I just Bruce, wanted... you're welcome to come up. You got a hand up. And uh... thank you, <clears throat> Bruce St. Peter, Snowberry Circle. Um, since we're working more on the axe, I'll start off with that because I do have some comments on the 150 as well. Uh, I guess one of the things that bothers me is, as John said previously, right now the split is at 2575. Um, we are septic users, um, sewer users are part of the 25. I don't know how to do the math without a ton of data, but I'm told it would be more like 8515. We have a ton of well, not a ton, but we have over 20% industrial base, which actually feeds money back into the town compared to the cost of the users. We have, and I'll use Yankee Candle as the most prevalent because everybody knows what it is. Uh, they wouldn't even exist over there in that swamp if it wasn't for sewer. Mm -hmm. And it's not just the tax dollars, it is what they have brought in for, an employ for employment and everything else. So in all reality, uh, you know, the town paying 15% is not, I don't feel it's out of hand. I think it's very minimal uh, for that reason. And, and that to prove the worth of the sewer plant, go down and shut the power off right now and see how valuable it is to the town, okay? Uh, you lost the town. So I don't think the 25, 75 split is that, uh, uh, overly burdensome on the town employees. I know the the argument is for the septic user, they have to pay their own and so forth. Well, because we do have this industry, this unemployment, this employ, uh, additional employment, everything, the tax rate has been subsidized for all of us, users and non-users mm -hmm. for years, which is, you know, I would hate to try to even calculate that portion. So there is a benefit to every non-user, a huge benefit to every non-user as well, even though they have to pay their own expenses if and when. But by the same token, we are paying, you know, uh, approximately 85% of that, plus the user's fees to dispose of our own. So that would be my feeling about that. That's why I would, I, you know, I don't have an issue getting rid of the 66 and two thirds percent. But I do think that the cap uh, that the town should be would be up to 25%. I think it should be fixed because precedent has already been set on town votes. Twice before, the town has voted against the sewer union. Once in the acts of 1935, one third of the town, even though it was legislated at that point in town, when it went to town vote, one third of the town voted against providing 25% to the users. Mm -hmm. Secondly, when chapter 150 was adopted, um, which is, of course is a void chapter, the town again voted that the sewer user would pay 100%. So the precedent has been set as to what the vote would be for a town if it's a flexible input. Mm -hmm. So that bothers me also why it should, uh, that it should be a fixed amount. As I said, the way it is right now, other than getting rid of the, uh, you know, town should have to pay more. I don't, that I, I agree with, that shouldn't have to be done. So mm -hmm. I want serious consideration uh, brought on those couple issues. Um, the other issue is, as I kind of, a little leery of this inferred walk softly with a big stick. What happens, you know, you're going, now this brought out, you're going after the not-for-profits. That's as simple as that. Now, we'll use $20 million because it's gonna be some plus or minus up there for $20 million. So you're talking about $5 million. And I did a little math and uh, um, right now, uh, the total exempt property in the town of Deerfield is $305,425,500. DA, 
which is the biggest one, um, is 57.7% of that. So they have $176 million, $116,113,200 of assessed taxable property. This is what is on improved properties mm -hmm. that are tax exempt. So now you have you know 13% for Eagle Brook, 9.6% for uh, uh, historic Deerfield, and I'm do doing a hold down. Frontier has 6.4%. The town itself has 5.6. Bement has 3.8. So I guess what my concern is, if you walk softly with that big stick, um, how is these not for profit? And I realize they're only pittance, but it is a pittance that they do pay in. Mm -hmm. How are they going to take this? Last year, DA themselves contributed $564,000 to this town. Right. Okay. They didn't have to contribute a penny. True. That's right. So you're talking $5 million that's going to be a total. It isn't like you're, you know, the user's fees, you have the right to already charge different betterments for that. If it costs more to operate that, that's already taken care of. So for $5 million, I don't want to see this town shooting itself in the foot. Agreed. Okay. Um, that's a good Bruce. point. Um, but I would also like to say, I don't think we have a betterment. Currently, the 150 bylaw would establish the ability to do betterments. And we're, we're, our goal is to work cooperatively with the nonprofits. In fact, they've all gotten together to create a, a team to work on this problem. And um, so the numbers of assessed real estate value, I think you're using are the same ones that I've looked at. And basically what it says is that, that the nonprofits would, would contribute like $4.2 million a year to the town tax base if they had to pay taxes. Um, so it's, a, it's, it's what it is where, you know, we have to deal with the reality, but, you know, yeah. obviously we, we want to work with the nonprofits to achieve fixing the plant because it's, it's a critical infrastructure for them. It's critical okay. for our residents who live down in that neighborhood. Um, but it is a, a very distinct place because there's not which industries, there's no industry as far as I know that feeds into that. Uh, I could be misinformed about that. Uh, I, I think that's really critical, Bruce, is, is you brought up the fact that they don't have to do anything, right. but they have approached us cooperatively because that. we've been working on this for years. And, you know, um, if something happens, it has to be fixed. And it's, in, it's disruptive to their operation if it's down. You can't flush the toilets. You can't have kids at school. I so understand. the idea is that we are averting any kind of crisis response. Poor Kevin is already stressed out enough. He doesn't need to be up there trying to figure out how to Band-Aid the sewer plant. So that it's trying to be, we're trying to approach this in a way that is methodical, is a win-win for all of us, and it gets done. We do not want to revisit this in for seven years or 10 years. It, time goes by wicked fast, I can tell you that. So this is gonna be a 30 year fix. It needs to be climate resilient um, and it needs to be done right. And I think our approach working cooperatively with them will produce that. So- um, And hopefully it does. It, but, oh. I know you worry, but well, uh, yeah, I, I think um, you know the biggest industry is is really Deerfield Academy and the nonprofits. They bring a ton of employment and a ton of good to this town. I mean, look at our EMS building, and um, yeah. you can always pick apart different things. Education of children, right? We do we don't get funding for that, but we do get gifts to the town, and they're always willing to help do so much stuff for our for our town of exactly. ball fields and build pits and do you know dugouts and there's right. a lot of things and and i don't want to i, I want to make sure and, and i think we have really are trying hard to work cooperatively they are the first ones to step up and said how can we help the 2575 it really isn't an issue because they they're gonna contribute they want to contribute they're not looking to go okay i don't want to do much on this they really want to help they've been nothing but generous to come and help and offer you know their expertise and going outside the box to kind of come up with ways to support the town it's a vital 
uh, infrastructure for them. I mean, they, they can't operate their school if it goes down. So they're, they recognize it. They recognize the position we're in. They recognize the political, you know, aspect of this whole thing. They just, they want to help. And they've been wonderful partners to the town for many years. And I, I can just see that continuing. And it's just about working out those fine details on, on um, you know, first, what do we do? Get, get some engineers in a room, figure out the three things. It needs a clarifier, it needs the headworks, and it needs um, the pit that's really deep in there, it's unsafe, fixed, and some electrical. So um, there, there is some vital basis of design that needs to happen, which our engineers will get together and kind of figure out. And then it's, a, you know, how do we come up, uh, you know, paying for it with betterments or some other thing. But I, I, I know that our relationship is strong and will continue to be strong and we'll get through kind of uh, working through this diplomatically. If, right. if, if, this, if this is so assured, then why do we have to put the stigma in, on this, on this that's amendment? A, that's a question. I don't, uh, I, you know, I don't, I don't see why, you know, if, if they're willing to work with it, then let it be just the way it is, get rid of the 60, 60 uh, that and leave us at 25%. I just, in the interest it's of uncomfortable time. that you're going to put up this wall that says, if I don't like what you're doing, I'm going to throw it back in your face. And they have done, as I said, I understand it's nowhere near what they would be, but it's a tremendous amount more than they would ever have to be. Mm -hmm. So I guess that would be my comments on that. If Thank it, you. Thank you. How about much. on 150? Can All right. Move? Okay. So um, I don't know how picky you want me to get, but um, you know, I heard a comment on one of the last meetings that there's a couple of us in town. Uh, my name was used that get real picky sometimes as far as uh, <laughs> what goes on. Before but, you start, Bruce, can I ask a question? Yes. Um, do you have a lot of these things written down? Uh, more or less. Uh, so I, I, can, I, I can. I can. I, the only reason I'm asking is because uh, we have a lot of other things to get through tonight. So if you could provide us with a summary without getting too detailed and then provide us with written documents, uh, you know, we can we can still make tweaks. Uh, uh, but that's just my suggestion. Well, see what you can do. Okay. Well, let's see what I have. Um, we know you can be a stickler. I would, well, I can go to a couple of things that I see is, is, right. is debatable meat that uh, the town might be interested here yep. um, and leave some of the others alone. All right. Um, let me get to that. Sorry. Oh yeah, sure, Erica. Okay. Um, oh. Hang on, Erica. Did you find it? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. No, go ahead if you got it. Oh, you got okay. It ready to go. Um, I guess uh, one fifty dash ten dash three. Uh, the board sewer commission shall determine the operating budget, user fees, and annual appropriation request, if any, for the sewer system. Prior to submitting its annual appropriation request, if any, the board of sewer commissioners shall determine its schedules of user fees. Now, you're already behind normally six months, so now you're going to move this up and get this done ahead of uh, uh, town meeting? I mean, it sounds like it's going to be a tremendous burden on you. Is this the definitions and meanings? Uh, no, this no, is it's management and budgeting. Yeah. Okay. So the board of uh, sewer commissioners shall determine the operating budget, sewer user fees, and annual appropriation request. Which one? Appropriation request. So, right, we usually set the user fees in November. Um, to go back to May. What's that? And, the, and for the rates that go back to the May billing. So to go um, back to the main thing? No, yes. I so what I what I want to point to is the reason why I mentioned 150-3 definitions and meanings. Mm -hmm. This is lawyers for you. Uh, no offense to any lawyers in the room. Um, uh, words shall have the following meanings as stipulated herein or in the sewer user regulations. Words used in the present tense include the future. The singular number includes the plural. So if it's speaking in the present tense, it could say it, it would encompass the fact that some of these things have to happen at different times. That's what my understanding is. So, um, but it's so I'll check on that. Yeah. 
I, well, it, that's just, a good question, though. I mean, I'm not a lawyer, so I'm just saying. Well, that, I'm not either. That, that's, uh, that's but so. it, I'm just going by normally. Yep. You're setting rates months after town meeting, and this is saying you're supposed to be setting it before you set the budget for appropriation. Well, don't we set that? I'm just. I may be a little confused, but we're setting rates next month for next year's budget. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So we're not going backwards. We're going forward setting rates next month and the bill that comes out next month will be for your May to November first billing. It's for what but it's for our isn't it for fiscal year? It's, it's for from, next fiscal year. Yeah. And those span two two calendar years. But for for twenty twenty three. Yeah. You're setting the rates for twenty twenty three is what your fiscal year twenty twenty three. Right. I, I we'll find out about yeah. that. It's a good question. Uh, 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 yeah, definitely. It's for, right. the, it's for the Let's calendar see. year. We're going to move on. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Uh, One fifty dash ten point four point two. Um, yeah. I guess in there again, I don't understand totally on this. Um, uh, let's see. The uh, shall assess owners of land abutting sewer line installed at a rate based upon a uniform uh, rate method. Um, the act allows a fixed uniform rate. Why is that not included as one of the options? I think it's probably saying the same thing, but it's saying it in a different way. A uniform unit method is a fixed method. Um, are you are you saying that the act has a says it's $20? Well, the the act has uh has two different provisions for uh, a fit. Well, the letter from attorney Mead's office is, is, says you have a fixed uniform rate or a uniform unit rate as, as either option. So it sounds like this has only allowing one option. Um, I think that's part of what the regulations are gonna specify. And um, there are several methods for <laughs> establishing what a rate is and, mm -hmm. and a, and if I'm reading this correctly, what it's saying is that there will be a uniform unit method, whether that's um, mm -hmm. you know Sweet. method A for uniform or method B for uniform. What it's supposed to do is guarantee that all users are treated the same way. So, okay, but we, I, we'll ask the lawyer to clarify yep. that too. Okay, I will uh, put the rest away and just send some notes on to Casey then. And, oh, thank you. And okay. uh, that'll work. Go from there. How's that? Thank you very much. Thank you, Bruce. Thanks, oh, Bruce. Thank we you. appreciate your detail for sure. Uh, did Erica have her hand up still, or is she she might have scooted? Anybody is Erica else there? Have any questions on this? Again, it's the acts. It's uh, it's replacing one hundred and fifty, and then it's uh, deleting two hundred and thirty-six, which that gives us a little time after town meeting, and I think before. It's like December, January, we need to have all the regulations done and we will have hearings on those regulations as well. Um, so people can, you know, weigh in on those questions and find things in them they might want to change. Um, great. Um, no other questions on sewer. I'm going to take a motion to close the hearing. I'll make that motion to close the hearing. And I'll second it. All those in favor? Tim Hilchey, aye. Trevor McDaniel, aye. Carolyn Ness, aye. Um, I don't want to take a vote right now on uh, the language yet because I think we have some discussions with our attorney to kind of get nailed down and have something for town meeting that was that's a solid yeah, thing. I, I, I just want us to have some ability to have some discussion on that. Mm -hmm. right? That's all. Yeah. The percentage. I mean. so yeah. That's fine. Well, do you want to do you want to have some discussion on it now? Or I mean, I, we know we've got a lot of other things to work no, on. No, I, I think we just we'll need a couple minutes. Yeah, okay. a couple right. minutes later on is fine. Thank you. I, I, I think we're all we're within 5%. I think <laughs> we're close. We're close. Um, well, the um, <clears throat> we have a first um, appearance tonight uh, before we get into the special town meeting warrant. Um, Julie Chalfont, our chair of the finance committee, was going to give a quick financial outlook. Um, it's always good when we have a captured audience to give us a snapshot of where we're at. So, um, are you able to kind of hook into anywhere? I think I'm probably going to be able to share. This. Share from share from there. Okay, great. And I don't think my battery's. Do you need a plug? No. Okay. 
Great and nice. Okay. Yeah. And then talk to this thing. As close as you can. All right. So um, finance committee has obviously been talking about finances for quite a bit. And we spent a lot of discussion on the library project and the um, financing of the library project. So what I have here to present to you is first going to talk a little bit about the debt we have right now, and then we're going to move into the library debt. So the debt we have right now, as of the end of the last fiscal year, June 30th, we had pretty much three debts left, the elementary school roof, the highway garage, and the South Deerfield wastewater treatment plant. And you can see the numbers there on the screen. That totals about $18.8 .8 million that we have in outstanding debt. In addition to that, echoing here. Um, in addition to that, we have another six million two hundred thirty-nine thousand dollars right here that is approved but unissued debt as of right now. That's for the South Deerfield wastewater treatment plant. We fully expect to borrow that and use all of that. So, given all of that together, we'll have just over twenty-five million dollars of debt. So. To get my brain around like how much is $25 million of debt for a town, this is sort of like the mortgage on the town's buildings maybe is one way to think about it. And so I started dividing it by stuff and seeing if that meant anything to me. Maybe it'll mean something to you. So the first one we did was per capita. We have a population of 5,090 people. You divide 25 million by that, it's just under $5,000 per person borrowing. We can look at it as a percentage of per capita income. If you take the total income in the town divided by the <coughs> same 5,090 people, this debt is 11.2%, um, that, you know, that $5,000 is. Um, as a percent of equalized value, equalized value is essentially the total of all of the assessed property in town that people pay taxes on. So it doesn't include the nonprofit. Um, and then as a percentage of our town budget. But that just gives you sort of a feel for those numbers in terms of that. If you wanna look at the debt service, how are we paying off that debt? Um, if we start right here, the school roof will be paid off next year. 2024, we'll be done with that. The highway garage goes out to 2034. Um, and then the South Deerfield wastewater treatment plant um, a good portion of that is a 40 year loan. So it'll go out to 2063. There's some portion of that that will be a 20 year loan most likely. Mm -hmm. um, so that'll wrap up in 2043. But this just gives you sort of feel for the, when stuff gets paid off and kind of a, a visual of the, I guess, quantity that we're paying off. Um, and this is debt service. So it's principal and interest that we're seeing. Um, if you look at that, oh, this thing's covering it. Um, if you look at that as a percentage, you know, sort of percentage of the tax bill, this right here, like where we are right now paying this off is around 5% of our tax bill is going towards that debt. Um, and if you look at the tax rate, our tax rate this year is 15.17. So 80 cents of that essentially is going towards this debt, paying it off. Um, the other point that's already been made tonight is that the sewer debt is not entirely town taxes. There's some of it that is paid from the enterprise fund. So this right-hand chart gives you a sort of a visual feel for how much is being paid by sewer fees versus how much is being paid from town taxes and whatever. All right, that's enough about current debt. So the library project, um, this is gonna come with a big caveat and um, there is, and I'll get to that in a second. So there's been a new estimate of the cost of the library project, and that new estimate is $12.3 million. And if we start breaking down that $12.3 million here, you know, up at the top of this little bar is $12.3 million. So there's a grant of 3.9, almost $4 million. Um, there is a, an additional fund that comes to us if we get the building LEED certified. Um, that amount, um, I was 
given the incorrect number. Um, there, there was a mistake in that. So that is actually 100,000, not 750,000. Okay, so that does make a difference in the numbers that we're going to talk about. I only found that out like half hour before this meeting started. <laughs> so I did not try and change everything because I knew I would hose it up. But um, I did manage, at, when we get to the end of this discussion, there's a little chart that has like how much you look at your house value and you see how much you would pay annually. I did update that and I am pretty confident that that is right. Um, I will verify it tomorrow and um, um, make sure that we have the right numbers, but I, I'm pretty sure that's right. But just so the process is the same, it's just that that one value, that 750 should be 100,000. Um, Okay, that was a lot of blending. So we have the grant for 4 million, we have the lead for 100,000, then we have the, the libraries working to get donations. Um, they have, their target value is $2 million worth of donations. They have somewhere 750, 760,000, something like that already committed of that. Um, so when you take all of that away, that, that leaves your remaining value of about 5.6 million. Um, one million of this is eligible for CPA funding because it's repairing an old building. You can do historic structures with CPA funding. So that takes it down a million. There has been a request sent into the state for us. I'm calling it a subsidy for lack of a better word, but um, some, do you want to explain that? Yeah. Sure, do that? sure. Um, Deerfield, uh, thanks to Carolyn, we, we started looking at the problem that 12 libraries in, in in the current funding cycle are facing their COVID related expenses. And so our initial request was, can we get the, the difference between the $8 million cost estimate that this project started at and which the award was based on the 3.9 million, can we get that from ARPA money, which is the American Rescue Plan Act, which was federal dollars that were sent to the states to mitigate COVID related cost increases. And we, banded together with 1,100 communities, and we're actually requesting 69 or $79 million, of the, which the legislature, um, the Senate in particular, is drafting language to see what they can do for the communities. So it's, it's something that we shouldn't count on, but it's something that we're pursuing uh, with every bone that we have, because obviously that would make this a much more affordable project for everyone if we could get a large amount of subsidy. So turn it back to you. I, I, I just wanna make a, uh, one more comment too. I mean, all I talked to every single community and everyone was definitely interested and um, there was enthusiasm to pursue this, um, but also there is some activity towards extending um, the ability for, you know, you know, there's deadlines that the library has to meet. So there is some, uh, you know, I, I don't want to say it's 100%, but there is a bill trying to be crafted to ex have some extensions, but also give the libraries, if in fact they don't come up with this money, which it would be another scandal that Chris should be writing about. But um, if, if in fact that no money is forthcoming, there is also a, a plan to let the library still receive the grant, but also cut back on their footprint and some of the prescriptiveness of the um, grant program. And, and that in itself is, is good news to us. So I, I, one final thing to add about that, this affects more than 25% of the Senate. So there are 40 senators and there are 11 senators that their communities are affected by this, which is a huge number. So we've got a lot of people and 40 legislators, reps and Senate together who all are affected by the same problem that Deerfield's facing. So there is a strong percentage of the, the legislature that's looking at this problem and looking to find a solution. So um, we might not get all of the money, we might not get any of the money, but we're asking and, and it, you know, it's information that, uh, you know, we won't have the answer to when we vote on October 24th. But. As, of, as of last week, um, 62F, which is, you know, the payback to the taxpayers was settled and there is 
approximately $2 billion still in sur surplus revenue, plus the $2.3 billion in ARPA funding. So that is absolutely critical that we start, at, you know, continue to advocate for that. Um, there is, um, to, you know, two public hearings that uh, we can participate in and say, spend the, this is what ARPA money was for. That will be on our webpage. We'll make sure that everyone can participate because this is your um, opportunity to reach out and inundate um, from all, you know, all the library groups are having the, you know, the, the attending the DLR hearing and I, our DLS hearing. And it's incredibly important that we participate. So again, there is opportunity here. I feel really confident that we should get some money or some relief somehow because there is so much involvement, but it is speculative. So just okay. heads up on that. Yep. Sorry, Julie. All right. So when we were trying to figure out how much people would be paying for the loan, we came up, we had a low loan estimate and a high loan estimate. Our low loan estimate assumes that we get this, the, um, uh, we get the grant, we get the lead funding at 100,000, we get the, the library gets the full 2 million in donations and qualifies for the CPA funding. The high loan estimate assumes that either you don't get all the donations or the CPA funding doesn't come about for some reason or there's some other issue. So it's a million higher. Um, and then we also looked at the interest rate and we looked at what, what we're trying to do is bound the problem. Right? What's the lowest reasonable value we think we could come up with? What's the, the high end value that is reasonable that we thought we could come up with? So we went between three and 7% interest rate it's going to be like three years from now by the time we do the final borrowing. So who knows what that's going to be. Um, and then we have the two loan amounts. So we're assuming a 20 year loan. We came up with an annual payment. If we divide that by the, the assessed property value, we can come up with a tax rate impact. Um, and again, these numbers you're looking at right here have that $750,000 um, tax rate. If these are the numbers with the hundred thousand dollar lead value, so the average the average single family home value in Deerfield is three hundred forty thousand four hundred fifty nine dollars. So if we take that low estimate three percent and borrowing less money, that's one hundred and forty three dollars a year for twenty years. The high estimate would be $239 a year for 20 years for that average. You can look at this list and see, you know, where your house falls in it. Maybe you have a million dollar house, in which case you're, you're um, doing pretty well. But um, you also have a, you know, you can look at, at what your estimate is. Um, in this right hand column, there's also like if we, you know, if that 4.3 million came through, um, it would be down around looks like $50 um, for the average single family home. So that just gives you a feel for how much um, the, the, the bounds, the range that you might be um, paying. If you wanna look at it visually, on the left-hand side is our current debt service. On the right-hand side would be the debt service with that lower library amount. And then this one, yeah, it did show up. That's with the higher the higher estimate. So that just gives you a visual feel for um, what we're talking about. And that's all I had prepared. If anybody has questions about this, otherwise I'll get out of the way. And then... Well, I would just like to take a moment to thank the Finance Committee and Julie in particular. She's done an amazing work on this. And we're you know blessed to have someone who's willing to dedicate time to do this kind of work. It's uh, it's amazing. Yep. Very I want to give a shout out to Brenda too for oh, all of the support that she's provided because she's oh. given like she, every time we come up with a number, Brenda checks it and makes yeah. sure that we're right. But I didn't get her to check the uh, the lead thing. So Any questions? <laughs> come on bad. up to the front. And, yeah. Did Candace sure. have something to say or did you not? You're waiting. Okay. Okay. Good. Yep. Oh, uh, Jeff Upton, Hillcrest Ave. 
a couple quick questions that I that I do have, uh, and then I do have a comment here. As far as the total debt that the town can take on, if the library estimate that you uh, that the finance committee figured out, where would that put us in the future? As far as we're actually in really good shape regarding the the debt limit. Okay. And I'll explain why. Um, there's actually two categories of debt. There's mm -hmm. Oh gosh, section seven and section eight. I yeah, probably have section those right. Eight. So Sewer section eight, eight yes. is excluded from the debt limit. Yep. And all of our sewer debt is section eight debt. And we did go back and check the debt paperwork. Mm -hmm. Um so and, and it does indeed say section eight, so that does not fall under the debt limit. Um, so if you exclude the sewer debt then we're well under our debt limit. I'm not advocating that we should borrow up to our full debt limit and do the sewer and do the old, old Deerfield wastewater treatment plant. That's a lot of money to be paying back, but we don't, like legally, we don't have to worry about that debt limit. Okay, thank you. Now there is some discussion on how this was coming about. Was this gonna be uh, the library project as far as bringing to uh, the special town meeting is this coming under debt exclusion or is it coming under two and a half override? It's debt exclusion. Debt exclusion. It's debt excluded as noted in the article, Jeff. Okay, I just wanted to check. Yeah, I've heard, heard two different stories there. Okay, and uh, with this, how is this gonna impact other projects, long-term projects that we've talked about such as Obviously, the old Deerfield sewer plant, the senior center, senior housing, so on and so forth. Does that pretty much put several of these projects on hold if we were to do uh, the library project? Well, um, um, I can respond to a couple of those things. Obviously, the library is arriving with their grant at this moment. Um, we. When, when I ran, I committed that I'd like to see a senior center established. Um, so the senior center is behind the library in the sense that there's been no no effort to get us, no meaningful effort to get a straight uh, a federal or state grant to help us pay for that. But we have asked Jim McGovern, and, and I think Trevor did this uh, for a, a grant. And I think Mr. McGovern mentioned the figure of $3 million towards helping us build a senior center. So we're starting the work on that. And on the senior housing front, we have a, an amazing woman, Lily Dwight, who's mm -hmm. been working with the senior, uh, with Sharon Bachork in the past and with Carolyn and the, the ad hoc senior housing committee now, uh, looking to work with a company called RDI, which is works under the umbrella of FERCOG to try and develop a project like the one that was just being completed in Sunderland at zero cost to the town. Mm -hmm. So there is a path where senior housing doesn't cost us anything whether we can achieve that and how soon it can occur is is what what the housing committee is working on and uh, there are lots of things that uh, julie and the C the connecting community initiative have been talking about we've been talking about this campus and it has many flavors and many possibilities one of which would even you know encompass if, if the 1888 former senior center, former grammar school is repaired using um, CPA money, maybe we would turn this building into a senior center. You know, so there's lots of different things going on, but the senior center is definitely on the radar and we have to work through the process. It, it takes time in a municipal and a government that's dependent on state and federal help to get these projects through. And the, the Tilton folks have been working on this since 2014 when, when the select board at that time, Dave Wolfram, Carolyn Ness, and I think Mark Gilmore voted to support their application. And I think, Trevor? Well, and just the other issue is that, um, you know, there are a school, there's a, the, the school um, loan authority. So, mm -hmm. and then with the libraries, there's the library loan authority. Our legislators are working hard to develop a municipal buildings loan authority um, so that 
but right now there is no avenue to get a 50% loan for a new town hall or anything like that. They're working on trying to just start with like a million dollar loan bank um, kind of thing. Um, so they're, it's a lot harder to pull off a senior center and, um, and a new town hall than it is, you know, to get a new school put in or a, or a library done because there is no avenue to get that. So I, I have worked, you know, we all have been working with our, our representatives in McGovern for one is very interested in our campus plan. And um, I saw him in Conway at the um, Festival of the Hills and, you know, pulled me aside. He said, hey, you know, we'd like to get together and talk about I'm, I've been asking for sewer money like mm -hmm. I've been upsetting people as much as I, mm -hmm. I've been asking for <laughs> sewer money and uh, I it really um, but I am beating that drum for years because there's federal grant money out there, there there's federal money that we all put up and sent to the state and uh, billions of dollars and it has not come to Western Mass and I've been you know so we work hopefully after the election we figure out who's governor, people sit in their seats. McGovern wants to sit with us and maybe we can get some meetings to talk about how do we get money to alleviate some of the sewer bills, which would free up money. I mean, the sewer has strangled everything. And, um, and I feel horrible because the library has been working on this for years and has done everything right and followed all the rules. And then you know, sewer came and just strangled everything. And it's really, it's unfortunate. So we're just trying to find ways to to make this all work and it it uh, there are choices everybody really you know these are choices oh yeah um, I, you know, I, I, everybody's going to have their own opinion there's right, there's right, no right. question about it i have some concerns with the with the proposed uh library expenses here to be honest with you uh you know and i know we've just had a supposedly an updated estimate of 12.3 uh the question being is that uh when uh, if this went through, when would we really be breaking ground? Well, if the, if we get ARPA funding, it has to be um, obligated by 2024, and it has to be expended by 2026. Okay. So you have to have shovel-ready projects, and I think that's what the library is um, advocating, is that they are shovel-ready, and so that would be one of the requirements if right. ARPA money is used. Okay, um, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at this as my own budget, how I run my household and how I've made purchases throughout my life and whether it be investments or actually material purchases. And when I look at that, uh, you know, back in 017, we had an $8 million estimate here we are sitting here, it's 12.3. If we're two years out to actually build this thing, it's not going to be 12.3. We all know that. So to start off with, I know we have to have a starting place at mm -hmm. some point, but this 12.3, I don't think is going to be a realistic figure. I believe it's going to be higher. That's my first concern. Mm -hmm. The We know, so that's a question mark right there could be more the grant the three almost four million dollar grant we know that's a guarantee mm -hmm. i like guarantees when i work with my financial uh issues mm -hmm. guarantees are good so check that off as a positive the donations two million dollars right now uh the library is eight hundred thousand that leaves $1.2 million that has to be raised for this project. That, again, becomes a question mark. That's not a guarantee. With that also, with that, if they come up with the $2 million, is that $2 million going to be dedicated to the building itself? Or is part of that $2 million going into reserve fund uh, for the library where they can use it at will? And so that's a question mark to me. The uh, lead certification, $100,000. It sounds that if you have an engineer designing this and that, that you should be able to uh, complete it for the certification, get the $100,000. But again, that's not a guarantee. So that's a question mark. Then we have CPA fund eligibility. 
of $1 million. To me, that's a question mark because it's got to go to Tom vote. That might be voted down at Tom meeting on the CPA money. So the CPA money is a question mark. That's not guaranteed. And then the state request, we have 4,300,000. Again, that's requested. That's not a guarantee. That's a question mark. So when I look at this, basically I'm looking at a little over $4 million that's guaranteed out of 12.3 million. And I need guarantees when I, when I spend money. I wanna know what the bottom line is. I wanna know how it's gonna impact me. And my concern is if some of these things don't sure. happen and all of a sudden we have accepted the grant and part of some other funds, where does that leave us if we vote yes on it in a special town meeting? Well, and, and myself, I can't vote yes when I don't know the bottom line cost. With all these variables that could happen, may happen, maybe not happen, I think it's easier to secure that money, have a special town meeting once that money is secured, so we know what the bottom line cost is for all the taxpayers. That's simply my opinion. I'm sure there's plenty of people that will disagree with that, mm -hmm. and that's fine. Everybody has a right to their opinion. Thank but you. myself, as it stands now, at special town meeting, I'm going to have to vote no on it. All right. Thank you so, for your comments. But thank you. Thank you. Yep. And also, thank you, everybody, for your hard work. Yep. Appreciate yeah. it. Is, is there any information that either the library or the uh, OPM would like to, to speak to? And yet, You're more than welcome. Sure. Because yeah, just these take are all name and use the mic. just an opportunity to answer the questions as they arise. Welcome. Uh, yeah, I'd pull uh, that. Actually, that one is working. That I one think works a lot better. Yep. <laughs> I Sorry, I don't know. Yeah, 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 yeah. we did. That's the whole goal yeah. here. <laughs> <laughs> so Thank you very much uh, for letting me speak. My name is Daniel Pallotta. I'm uh, president of P3. We're the OPM for the for the library project. And the previous speakers' questions were were actually excellent questions, considering you know the times we're in. Uh, the loan from the uh, state is guaranteed. Uh, it's it's uh, it's already been bonded. And should you fulfill the obligation of uh, the other percentage? Uh, you, you will be guaranteed to get the entire uh, grant amount. With regard to the lead funding, there's a minimum uh, amount that smaller communities get, and that is 100,000, uh, and that's for lead certification. That's not for lead silver or lead gold or, or lead platinum. So that's just for lead certification. And the Tilton Library is uh, easily going to get lead certification. So that $100,000 will be coming to 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 the to the town as soon as the project is completed the the cost of the library and the increase in the library uh, we didn't pull the numbers out of thin air uh, the the documentation was done properly when we did we applied for the grant round uh, when you got your uh, notification from uh, the MBLC uh, that you had six months to vote on this uh, we immediately did uh, an estimate, uh, an additional estimate uh, to upgrade those numbers. Within that number are some safeguards to prevent it from going over budget. First and foremost, we know that construction will probably start uh, sometime between eight and 10 months from the date you vote. Uh, it's not gonna be years, it's gonna be eight to 10 months. And there is 8% uh, escalation built into that number. So we're assuming that inflation is not stopping and that it'd be another 8% on top of that estimate. We also have a 12.5% uh, design contingency uh, to, 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 to cover things that uh, come up as we complete the design and get the bidding put together. So from those two standpoints, uh, you know, I want to clarify that, you know, this is a typical process for a municipal project. Uh, and, you know, 
this is not Amherst, which designed it and, 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 and did an estimate a long time ago and then was shocked uh, when they came back uh, and, and their numbers went up. We knew the numbers were gonna go up as soon as you got your notification and we did the estimate. And from this point forward, we're locked into that 12 million and change. So the project will cost uh, 12 million and change. Uh, the internals on uh, her shot, I can't speak to. That's Fine. a that's a local that's that a local uh, uh, a local political thing, yep. but I can tell you from a construction standpoint and a design standpoint, the project will stay within budget. Thank you. Okay. Yep. Thanks for those comments. Sure. Yeah. Welcome. Hi, I'm Candice Bradbury Carlin, um, director of the Tilton Library. Before I made any comments, I wanted to welcome um, our fundraising consultant, uh, Eric Phelps, to make some comments um, about fundraising. Oh, great. Welcome. Welcome, Eric. Good evening, everybody. Yes. Yep. So I just want to say that it is true that there is additional funding to be raised. We have had conversations with prospective donors. We have vetted the entire regional um, the town information regarding people who've supported similar projects in the area. We had, uh, I think it was eight or nine cultivation events this past year. The fundraising committee has had nine meetings. Part of the challenge is chicken and egg. So we have a bunch of folks who we believe will support achieving the, the $1.2 million raise in addition to towns folks who will contribute their portion as their own kind of philanthropy. But we, that is made incredibly challenging by not saying yes to the project. In other words, the understanding that it is those parameters as Dan described of the particular project, the design that has been approved, the design that's being reviewed. And if not, if there is not the basis of that formula, we have a very different kind of philanthropic raise on our hands. So I would say those are the challenges on the downside. And I would say on the upside, I see it as this, the library and the friends have done an incredible job securing 750 X thousand dollars worth of philanthropic support, including six, five and six figure gifts. So when we look at the funding pyramid estimates for that, we feel like we're confident we can get to that or very close to that. Again, I just want to acknowledge that it's not a certainty. Um, this is the 25th capital campaign I've worked on. Um, 18 of those have been successful past their goal. So I feel like those are the wind in our sails. Thank you. And one question for you. Um, have you, you mentioned that, that you've gotten commitments from for about 750,000 plus. Have mm -hmm. you started talking to you know, the large commercial entities in town uh, about their level of support yet? We have, and we have not. Um, we know that business support certainly will could contribute to this campaign and we expect that it will. Uh, but in general, we look toward individual support, including business owners and individuals who would support it. Only 5% of philanthropic contributions are from businesses. No offense, present company accepted, but it's not our first target in the quiet phase. Okay. But yes, the answer is there would always be that opportunity. We have talked to some folks. We are and will be applying for grants. Again, the answer to how is yes. Thank you. Saying yes. I guess, uh, I guess the, the one question that was brought up is, you, you gather all this money, how do we know it goes to pay the bill? Like, what, like, what do you do? Yep. You, what's so the, the pledge form that we use will require, there's a couple of little nuances in there as you all, you're very familiar with nuance in yep. your work. There's a few nuances that are secured because it's a municipal building, but essentially every donor gets the opt-in to say this is for the capital gift exclusively. And we are doing it as a capital campaign for a building raise, not for an endowment, not for other things, not for programming. Um, the Association of Fundraising Professionals Code of Ethics says that we have to abide by donor wish. Mm -hmm. Currently, every existing gift is for the building 
upon the condition that this building project happens. So there are pledges yep. that will be realized upon you know, the belief that it's moving forward. So they, they lay in a state of question right. only, only because we haven't moved forward with the bond. And there, and there would be uh, what paid to the town of Deerfield to pay off the loan kind of thing. That's yeah, so there, and, and just to be clear in capital campaigns, very common we'll be talking about multi-year pledges. So if I'm making right. a commitment of $100,000, I may be doing 30,000 a year. That would go against the, the yep. debt service that's been proposed. Perfect. I know that Julie's laid that out. We know it would get very nuanced as those pledges were paid and we would be paying an initial tranche of money from the first round of pledges, the next round, et cetera. Some folks may have seen the similar process in Greenfield. They just announced their next half million dollar tranche. Actually, too. that was my question. What is the timeline on your pledges? Uh, depending on the donor, they'd be uh, three to five years. Right now we've got some, uh, almost all of them are three year pledge uh, commitments. Some are one-time gifts. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions anybody has? So Skip, if you want to come on up, find a mic that works. You can sit here too if you, and that mic works. Are these questions for Eric? I, I'm not sure. Anybody oh, here? Because I had yeah. another cop. Oh, comments. you do? Oh, yeah. Yes. Well, please first. Yeah, then have a seat and go ahead, Candace. I wasn't sure I just, waiting I just wanted to, um, to highlight three things. One is even though we're really proud that um, the library is very well maintain maintained, uh, the trustees over the years have done a great job uh, of making uh, keeping our building beautiful, but it's still old, uh, built in 1916. And um, you know we're starting to see some of the, the cracks in the facade, literally. And, and Trevor's been there to see it. Yes. <laughs> and so we feel like um, you know nothing lasts forever. Um, and if we have a $4 million grant and then um, that we would lose if we didn't get this project voted in, um, as well as donations that are hinging upon this, the, the voting of the, of the bond, um, that we would miss an opportunity really quickly. It would be gone really quickly come January 9th if the building starts to fall in disrepair, which we've seen other buildings in town do that, and we know what that can cost, um, would we be totally regretting not taking this opportunity? So that's the first point. The second point is, um, thank you again, Carolyn and Tim. Um, haven't talked to you, Trevor, as much about it, but I know you back it, the, um, uh, approaching the, the yes, state legislators, been doing great work. Um, because the legislators have responded. All the libraries coming together, which was a great idea, so we all work together, um, all 12 libraries, 12 towns. Um, there's been an email developed, and that has been sent from each library through their trustees, through the select boards, and through community members. And some of you here tonight might have seen that email and signed it. And so we're keeping track of how many um, from each town is being sent out to the legislators. And I'm telling you, we've got several hundred coming from our town. Mm -hmm. And it's got the attention, like we said before, 40 legislators. And there's, um, you know, they're drafting bills. They're, they're having conversations. Um, and I feel like that's not something to take lightly. Um, so if you haven't seen this email yet, please let me know. I can direct you to that. If you have seen it, um, but haven't read it, please read it. If you haven't signed it, please consider signing it. It doesn't hold you to a yes or no vote on this project. It holds, it holds you to support the state giving our town $4.3 million back that we lost during COVID because of the um, cost es escalation because of COVID. So, um, and then the third point I wanna bring up is something that Carolyn brought up um, earlier, which is that there are these public um, comment webinars about you know, making the case for getting these ARPA funds. One is tomorrow um, from 12 to two, and we can have that information available for anyone who's interested. And there's a second one, I think it's November 8th or 10th. No, 10th. November and 10th. 6 to 8. 6 to 8 p.m. And uh, it should be posted on your webpage and it should be posted on our webpage. Yep is the DLS is holding these hearings on how ARPA money should be spent. And we should advocate for ARPA money coming to Western Mass because we have not gotten our fair share. And certainly we have a shovel ready project that they should support giving ARPA money. And right. that was totally impacted by um, COVID. This mm -hmm. is definitely COVID impacted. So it's justified. We should have all be consistent in we need our fair share. 
the project is shovel ready and um, you know, it is definitely COVID impacted yes. expenses. Yes. So it's justifiable. Our, in our, um, you know, Joe Comerford, our state senator and Natalie Blay, our state rep are, have worked tirelessly on behalf of Deerfield for all kinds of projects that we have worked on. They brought a hundred thousand dollars for the senior center uh, this year, and they are really behind this and working with their colleagues in the state uh, Senate and, um, and house to really kind of pull these people together. They're, um, they're working hard for us to, to do this. So I feel pretty confident that something yeah. will come of this, whether it's 4.6 or everybody gets everything, but you know, Tim's email, the first ops kicked this all off and, and Carolyn's ideas behind this, I fully support. And, um, you know, legislatures are working really hard for Deerfield for sure. Great, thank you. Thank you. Yep. I assume this is working? Yep, yes. Okay. So I just wanna verify at Monday's meeting, the town meeting is going to be asked to borrow bond or how, whatever you wanna call it, $12.3 million. And we anticipate that we will receive $4 million from the state government at, and I'm not sure how we will receive that. Will that be the grant? Will that show up as a $4 million or will it be $60,000 a right. year for 20 years it, for five or years. whatever? It is. No, it's, five it's, five. it's a percentage as, a, as, as the project gets done, but I think you should get the correct answer from our OPM. Yeah. You know what? Uh, you got to repeat into this so everyone on the. <laughs> no, it's it's one of the. You we know, hybrid, the land of hybrid. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> in this fiscal year, when you sign the grant, which would mean that you fully funded the grant, um, the twelve point three million, the the state will immediately send the first payment of twenty percent of the grant, which is about eight hundred thousand. Um, in the next fiscal year, starting July one. As soon as we complete the bid documents, uh, the second grant payment will, will come to the town. Uh, the third grant payment comes on the issuance of the building permit in the next fiscal year. And the fourth grant payment comes upon the completion uh, of the project. The final grant payment uh, comes a year after the completion of the project. Uh, this is a relatively small library and you know this is our fourth library and three of the four libraries got double grant payments in one of those segments because this the library commissioners can't return money so the smaller libraries kind of pick up the scraps so uh you can count on it in five years but i would be shocked if it was not four years I, does that make sense yes I, I think I, I basically understand it. Uh, when will we break ground? When do you anticipate breaking ground? And then how many months will it take to complete the project? And I don't hold you to that, but a rough idea. Two weeks. No, <laughs> Two weeks. Two weeks. I don't know if you ever saw that. Well, I'll give you four. <laughs> uh, it will probably break ground between. Uh, 10 and 11 months. Uh, we'll be, so next we'll fall. be in bidding. We'll be in bidding in eight months. Mm -hmm. So um, next fall when correct. we break ground. We and how long will it take to actually complete the project? We expect the project to take somewhere between uh, 13 and 15 months. Okay. The, uh, the only reason I ask is that we've got an elementary school right behind us here that uh, was built 30 years ago. Uh, we broke ground in, I believe it was in June of uh, well, whatever it was, 18 months later, we were moving kids in and school was starting. So, and that was a uh, 64,000 square foot. Right. So if you could do it in something close to that or even le or less. The, the uh, uh, Greenfield Library up the street is, uh, is an 18 month build. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was based on the fact that we had to knock down a building and we had to wait. Yes. But it's, uh, that could have been done, that could have been done in 16 months. Okay. If we didn't have to destroy the uh, fire station. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And by the way, uh, 
I remember us raising funds for the school, and I'm not sure what the dollar amount was, but I'm going to say it was roughly 200,000, and the town's share of the building cost was about $2.6 million. We should have hired a consultant to come in and, and do some fundraising for us. <laughs> exactly. Yep. Uh, Bruce? If anybody online wants to raise their hand as well, if they have comments, and then we can get, I mean, we've got a lot to cover still tonight, but if there's anything else that's new. Uh, Bruce St. Peter, Snowberry Circle again. A um, couple quick questions. Jeff kind of touched on it. Uh, I guess my question is, is if we go this route, we're going to uh, be very close to the debt limit, which of course exempts municipal buildings. But what is it, the cost going to be for any other projects down the road if we do this? Because it certainly is going to affect the bond rating. In the last 10 years, I think we've dropped, what, four or five points on the bond rating. And now if you start getting over, you know, jumping up this fast, uh, it's going to have a tremendous amount of uh, difference on the bond rating for any future projects. So, it's, so what you pay now, you're also going to be paying for the library on future projects. And I'm looking at the um, uh, projected debt in millions. Uh, if you uh, include the library for 2023, it's 37.4 million. Uh, next year, 39.4. 25 and uh, 25, it jumps up to 55 million. Now, uh, and that's including that's you know that's including the old Deerfield wastewater treatment plant. But as Jeff said before. Uh, yes, you'd like to negotiate something, but uh, you know that's not a guarantee that you are going to. And it stays in the 50s for all the way through 29, which is as far out as this expended. So I'm quite concerned on that. The other thing uh, is, you know, in this time, I mean, any other time, because it it wouldn't be pro nowhere near a problem. But you know, heating bills, people are going to be paying dearly for that. Uh, electric bills, uh, leverage just is going through their colonial power is, is just sent out a revised aggregate for the upcoming year from 10.6 cents to 23.4 cents. They're saying a $78 uh, increase on just the electric usage for a standard bill. Hmm. Uh, the inflation factor alone, okay, even if it stabilized at five or 6%, is still uh, a tremendous burden on everybody, not just, you know, you know everybody in the country. Mm -hmm. uh, the other question I had is on the donation of approximately $800,000, is that the full contribution? Uh, basically what I'm asking is who's paying for the OPM and the fundraisers at this point in time, or is that coming out of the donations? So those are my couple questions. Thank you. Can we have I can address one of them. <laughs> we'll stay out of the others. But yeah. um, for the re regarding the the debt limit and the bond rating, um, I had a discussion with Tom Scanlon, who is our town auditor, and he's also the auditor for something like eighty other towns in Massachusetts. So he has solid background to discuss this from. Um, First is that we are, again, we're not approaching the debt limit because there is a separate debt limit, right? Um, so we are well below the debt limit. The other thing that he said is that even approaching the debt limit does not actually um, significantly adversely impact your bond rating at all. The things that affect your bond rating are management, reserves, demographics, and economy. You can't do much about demographics and economy. So if you ignore those, um, we have very healthy reserves in town. So that is a plus for us. The management issues are um, what he mentioned were things like consistency, managing your local receipts. Um, and if you're the, the other thing he mentioned that was a good point was debt exemption. So if you vote, um, to, to if you debt exempt vote, if you do the debt exempt vote, then you have a mechanism for raising the funding to pay the bills. Um, so from the perspective of the people loaning you money, they are satisfied with that and are unlikely to, to adversely impact your, your um, I've lost the terms. Your rate, interest rate. Yeah. Bond rate. Thank you. Yes. Um, so, so all of that. But I, I will tell you, so 
Finance Committee is revisiting this again on Friday. Finance Committee is very concerned about the um, amount of the, the increases in town taxes, and they've been going up for quite a bit um, over the past 10 years. And um, there, there's definite concern among the Finance Committee about the amount of debt that we want to take in and all of the different projects. Um, but again, we haven't you know, we voted it once, but there's new information since we voted it. So we will be revisiting it again this Friday. Um, I, have to, I, just, I would just like to take a, a second yeah, to ahead. say, I am really concerned about the cost of this project, but I feel like it's a two-step process. The first step is going to town meeting, but it's allowing the library to move forward and have the opportunity to get additional funding for this project because we have the debt exclusion ballot question. And I mean, I was looking at the calendar and you know, we wanna delay that so we have the opportunity to have as much information as possible. But you know, when you look at the calendar, um, January 9th is a Monday. So it's like, we have to make that decision by that day. So then we're making the, you know, if we delay the, our ballot vote, we're in that week coming back from, you know, you New know, Year's. Christmas break, New mm -hmm. Year's break. So I'm not really sure. I mean, we have to fiddle with the calendar if we can, because we should be as close to making our ballot decision, which is your check on how much this project is actually going to cost and how much money. Jeff, Jeff has questions on what is a solid guarantee gives us a, the longest period of time to try to get that solid guarantee. So, you know, Taxes have been going up. This this is a huge project for us to take on by itself. But on the other hand, we would be foolish not to to think about the absolute value of investing in the library. I, I we do need a library expansion, and I'm not saying that we can't do it some other way if this doesn't pan out. But uh, because I really believe in the campus, and we are we have tons of grants, you know, in the air. It seems like we got you know, juggling balls here, but stuff is happening and we are getting grants, but we, we need to give the library a chance. And, and, and I, I feel like there is, as Tim said, there is so many people now involved by reaching out. You know, it was one of those things at two o'clock in the morning, I'm saying, why aren't we doing this? You know, this was back in the spring. And like I said, every single community that I reached out to was definitely enthused about this. So I, I feel like the impact is going to happen. We just needed to have a little bit more time. So if we could have faith in the process to say, let's support this and then have the check of the actual ballot you know, to see what the what is solid, because we, we don't know if we're going to get how much ARPA money we're going to get or if we're going to get any ARPA money. But if we do, that's up to 4.3 million is what we feel is the impact of COVID. And then we get this th almost $4 million grant from, um, you know, the library people, you know, that's $8 million coming into our community for a library. So to me, it, there is a it, there is a risk factor, but it, it it should be an opportunity here. I see this as an opportunity. Yeah, so a couple of things I want to ask Julie a question, but first I'd like to say, um, we've invested a lot of money in physical infrastructure because for various reasons over the past forty years we didn't do necessary maintenance, we didn't do necessary upgrades, et cetera. And and the reality is we needed to do the sewer. Um, that's physical infrastructure. We can't neglect our human infrastructure, which is what some people think is a want rather than a need. I would submit that good libraries attract good people to your town. It's like having good schools. And so you need to think about it. And, and I would say that on October 24th, you vote yes. On, November, on December 6th, or if it's January 2nd, when we, we actually vote on, are we gonna commit to this? You can vote no, but in that interim time, the library gets an opportunity to work with the Senate, work with the, the House of Representatives, work with the governor's office, possibly the newly elected governor, and you know we can move the ball. So, and now the question for Julie, do you happen to know how much debt limit qualifying borrowing we've done versus the almost 
two twenty million dollars that's going to be the the debt limit the, the debt borrowing for the sewer mm. or is that something you haven't um, figured out it's in my computer oh. <laughs> can go get it and see. i'm just curious if ballpark is um, it two million is it five million oh no 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 the um the And our our debt. No, because the highway garage. Yeah. Yeah. And the and highway garage. So this would add to it. So yeah. it would be it would be fifteen once we got to that point. And then as we obviously as you pay off the debt, it goes down. So it right. would be fifteen on whatever January, whatever that mm -hmm. we voted this. Yeah. And then almost immediately would start going down as as the grant came in and the donations came in and all of that. And then a follow up question: the the, what we've been referring to is the debt ceiling. Um, it's currently like forty three point five million. It's I mean, forty million right now. Yeah, Next year it'll be like forty three. Yeah. So we're saying fifteen million. We've we borrowed against that limit, and there's a remainder of twenty five million dollars. So that's. I just want you to understand. There's there's borrowing is borrowing, and you got to pay off your debts. There you go. But <laughs> um, the interest rate question. You know, we we were working under an assumption that has been clarified. And so I just wanted to clarify that for everyone. We have a, uh, Eric, um, Eric, do you have a comment online? I just want to say that I, I heard a question about fundraising, but I was coughing so hard I missed the last part of the question. So if it could be repeated, I'm happy to answer it if I can, but I just didn't catch it. Did we have a question on? Uh, the gentleman who spoke before these comments at the very end, something about fundraising events, and I just oh, want to... we should have hired you when we did the did the uh, school twenty years ago. <laughs> yeah, that was that was the, no, the the question Bruce had was, um, I'm going to be somewhat blunt. Who's paying for the fundraising, and where's that? Oh, uh, oh, the, the fundraising the is being paid for everything. by the friends of the library under private funds, not public funds, as oh. was the cost estimate revision was also paid by private funds raised for that purpose. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Matt, come on up. Thank you, Julie. I'm curious how many want to go through this whole warrant. I know. We're going to start designating to do two, two Monday, minutes for war in a long night. And then we still got the rest of it. First of all, thanks to the Finance Committee for their incredible work of putting some numbers together. It's yeah, always better. Yay. Yay, Julie. It's always better to have some true numbers to look at so we've got some real picture of what's going on. Which brings me to my point. Um, we've done a great job in this town of doing capital projects. We've done an awful job in this town of taking care of those buildings after they've been built. Yeah. We've got very little money set aside for maintenance and repair. So my concern is just as we invested over a million dollars in a track at the high school, my question at the meeting was, what's the budget to maintain the track? To which I got, we don't have a budget. Right. So we're gonna build a track going to put it out there and we're not going to take care of it. And when it cracks and fills with water and those seams expand, they'll be coming back to us in however many years. We we'll want a new the track. Tennis courts first. So. They'll come for what? Come for the tennis courts first. So tennis courts, I've heard, you know, a little bit about a roof. So yeah, there's a lot of it. we know there's more capital coming from Frontier. That's going to be a request. The same CPA money we're talking about for the library, we're competing with the 1888 building for that funding. Mm -hmm. So that funding goes one way or another. It's, it's not the same million dollars that's gonna come out into both hands because it's only $1 million. So if it goes to the library, it's not there for the 1888 building. So that's gotta get deducted out of that project and we need to figure out what happens with that. And again, we're going to build a $12.3 million building. I spoke with an, a, somebody who does facilities management on a regular basis. And his estimate was typically about 3 to 4% of the, of the value of the building should be set aside as an annual maintenance budget. So 3 million or 3% of $12.3 million 
$370,000 or so. Um, I don't know what the additional staffing is to staff that additional space. So we're not just talking about a loan payment. We're talking about a loan payment. We're talking about maintenance of the building once it's built. And granted, the initial maintenance, you won't have the major projects to do, but there are things that have to be maintained. And no more than you do in a house, we should begin putting money aside. So when you do have issues, there's money there to take care of it. What, what's the staffing going to look like? How many more librarians, FTEs are we going to add? And again, not just the cost of the labor, the labor, the benefits, the, the whole package that goes into that. So are we looking at another $500,000 a year on the tax rolls that we've got to cover when we're already competing? I think Julie mentioned this 5%, about 5% of what we pay in taxes goes to cover debt. We know there's about 70% in this town that goes to education. And the remaining departments in this town fight like heck to try to get the balance of that 25%. Now we're gonna add an additional upwards of $500,000 a year to help cover those costs at the library. I just wanna make sure we're looking at all of this and the fact that, again, we haven't done a great job of maintaining what we've got. So there's additional maintenance costs that need to be figured out to maintain the buildings that are here, not to mention Something's, you know, if we're going to do something with the church across the street, and I know there's senior center and all kinds of things being talked about. Again, it's 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 additional cost, um, and my concern gets to be as we talk about. I know we've got plenty of room on the debt limit. My concern gets to be what's the capacity of the taxpayer to continue paying all that debt service if we look to do all these projects. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's what we're concerned about, too. Yep. And just to clarify uh, about the CPA, there are two, two mechanisms that we've been talking about for using CPA money to do the 1880 building. And this one would probably fall under a similar thing of bonding against future CPA receipts. Um, and there's currently in excess of $1.4 million in the undesignated fund um, if the senior housing project moves forward and we find a way to RDI will just pay all the charges so we don't spend any, there's 600,000 in there that would go back to the CPA. Um, so yeah, there's some challenges definitely and we need to be smart about how we spend that money. Um, you know, so uh, the library is ready to move forward. The 1888 building is in the same time frame, So we, we've got to think about that carefully. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Anybody else? Oh, yeah. Come on up. Fran Nada, Conway Street. So okay, I'm friend. trying to get something clarified here. Who legally owns the library? <laughs> this has been a, a, a question we've had quite a bit like who owns the library who manages the library how do you get money for a library that you don't own or do own um so from we've asked this question in 2019 to um to our attorneys and the um the town owns the library but it is the it is the trustees you know that the bill tilton left it to the trustees of tilton to um to to run a library. So if you look on the deed, it's the deed is under the trustees of the Tilton Library. And then, um, but it is, you know, all intents and purposes, a town building. The land <laughs> under it is the town's. How is it the town if the uh, deed, li registry of deed states yeah. it's the library's trust? Well, libraries are yes. a little different animal than like school or anything else they're really they're in trust of the town to 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 run um you know to maintain yep. you know back in the day you'd had you know, wealthy entrepreneurs would leave or endow their their books that they've gathered over their lifetime to the benefit of the town and it's you know so they would leave that they would leave some money for a building or a you know maybe it's taking care of the elderly or it could be any kind of thing that they leave and then you know, over years, the town winds up taking over, you know, ownership of, um, you know, maintaining the building and all of that we pay, you know, we pay each year to do that. And then there's also a residual 
um, funding mechanism, the leftover endowment from Tilton to, to pay for, um, you know, a, a portion of the cost to run the town, you know, run it and yep. do whatever they need to do. Correct. Yeah. So we had our attorneys, you know, which I gave you. So you yep, could look I, at that. Too. I read it here, like your attorney yeah. says, provided 1995 that the library was owned by the board of trustees. And then somebody says they don't agree. What was that? I'm sorry. It, it says right here that the library was owned by the board of trustees, but I don't agree. Right. <laughs> so it's kind of See, confusing of it is, where it, it is black and white that states there's the not, town owns a library. There's not a lot of black and white when it comes to a library <laughs> in a town. They're, they're really kind of a, a joint venture. Um, so, and now shouldn't we be on the deed or on the assessor's card? I don't. The town of Deerfield? I'm not so sure it really needs to be, but um, you know, I'm not a lawyer. Because whatever I read, I read a lot of stuff yeah. that states that you know all the loans and all that. If it's a private entity, which it is on the books, that we can't use all this money. We can. So, so libraries are one of the things set aside in state legislature that that allows for towns to again, raise and appropriate for the benefit of the public. And the public library is, you know, is one of those items. It, they're, again, they're a different animal than most. It's a valid question. And, yep. you know, we can certainly send it back to Lisa again for another. Oh, definitely. Yeah. Be nice. Yeah, for sure. And the other thing I would suggest is that um, if the state and the MBLC are granting millions of dollars to entities, the ownership consideration has been probably vetted about 60 million times, but we should definitely ask our own lawyer to give us a straight answer about what is what is the logic of town ownership, even if there is a trustee set up. Mm -hmm. uh, and we do elect trustees, do we elect all of them? Yeah, yeah. so, um, you know, the voters do vote on this. So it, it's a really interesting question and, and we should get a, <laughs> get a really well would love an answer exactly yeah. a really good yeah. answer that we could oh. all understand yeah please Candace, come, you come up to this chair here yeah please do it's comfortable <laughs> very nice yes <laughs> um what's your name fran fran hi um i'm candace the director of the library so yes um i guess there there was a question back in 2019 i think wendy foxman was yes. the yeah and she worked with um my predecessor sarah woodbury um the uh director and um and lisa mead and, and they came to the conclusion that it was a town um it was owned by the town um i think that you know when you go back in small towns and you look at the history of um like meeting minutes you know it, it's just that i think that now we're so careful about you know ownership and language and everything and i think that you know, when you look back in like the early days it's just handwritten on a you know, oh, mind yeah. notebook. And that's just the way it was, you know, back in 1917. Um, but I would say, you know, definitely if the money's coming in for the library, um, I mean, for the town, it's going to be going into the town's account. It's not going to go into any library account, the grant money. Correct. But once we transfer it over to, to pay the bills for the trustees, that's given money to somebody that's not part of Deerfield. The town writes the check. Yeah, the town yep. writes the check. Not, not the trustees don't trustees write any checks write to the exactly. for the building. Yeah. Um, and the other thing is, all public libraries have a board of trustees. It's like kind of like a school committee, right? And um, because we are a different animal, because of the way we serve the public and our history, um, you know, we have our own, and it's it's a way of kind of like oversight, right? Because we do so much. Our work is so complex. We serve so many people in different demographics. Um, kind of, we're almost in a similar um, category as education. So, you know, we need some oversight. And so we have a, a board of trustees and that's a true for every library, unless it's a private library, but all public libraries have that. And that's good for the townspeople to know that, you know, uh, you know, public library for, for um, public citizens um, that has a public staff, you know, I'm, a, I'm an employee of the town, um, is being, uh, has oversight by a publicly elected board. So, um, I guess that's what I had to say. Yeah. Great. <laughs> just, yeah. We're just trying to clarify if you know sure. who really owns it. Yep. Okay. And uh, on that. I just want to, my name's Becky Pitcher at West Street. I just want to add to what Francis is saying. Um, I did research throughout Franklin County, and there's only two places in Franklin County that town does not own it. 
Deerfield and Montague. Mm -hmm. Montague's, uh, it says the inhabitants of Montague. I, the letter that you're referring to, it's right here from 2019, the town attorney lays out instructions on how to transfer that into the town's name. Mm -hmm. That was never done. Yep. My question is why wasn't that done? And it should be done. Yeah, well, it, it may. I don't think it's uh, super critical at the moment, but we'll, you know, uh, again, we'll reach back to Lisa. This question was just brought up again tonight. So we don't have Lisa with us and we don't have all the information. So we'll take your comments and we'll we'll pass them on and get you some answers. Because yeah. there's a, a dissenting opinion in here from attorney David decision saying in 1995, where he concluded that the library was owned by the board of trustees. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> it's clearly not town owned. Yeah. But you want to dump all that money into something that uh, Francis Legally also, don't have. <laughs> he also found articles where the library was bought and sold within the last 20 years without the town's approval. Yeah. So what makes it that they can't do it tomorrow? Sell it to who, like, they're not going to transfer the, it to the deed yeah. in your name, in the town in Deerfield's name. I, I, I didn't legally, follow your question. What's that? I didn't follow your question. What, what was the, the couple tra land transfers that you had? So again, and if you want to leave off that stuff, we'll we'll get you some. Yeah, you all got a copy of this. Yep. Is that everything though? We got everything you've got there? Yes. Okay, great. Yeah. I got right. more at home, but but you have this letter, right? Yes. And, yes. It, and it lays out the step by step that the town was allegedly working towards. Yes. And somewhere dropped the ball. Well, I, I think um, if that's the it's same letter, that, if that's the same letter that I've only been on the board for five months, but if that's the same letter that uh, I was made aware aware of, I've actually started working with Casey to make sure that the library and um, our council agree on structure of the trustees and various other issues and i would also say that the 1995 um decision that you're citing is what is it 30 some odd years old versus the 2019 opinion so there there's lisa is a very uh, reliable lawyer and you know legal questions are difficult but we will certainly clarify this and um, if there is a transfer mechanism that needs to come take place because we want everyone to feel comfortable that it's actually town owned, then if that's Lisa's opinion, we'll, we'll have to bring that to people. And there's work that the trustees need to do as well. So there yeah. was work they had to do before we could get involved again. So, you know, it's a, it's complex when you get into old buildings like that. Yeah. So right here, division of local services. All right. Uh, so I have something to add to move. this actually. Um, well, I'm going to stop it in a minute. I'll okay. let you speak yeah. and then I'll take your information and we'll get answers. So the, the, the Tilton Fund, on. which is the fundraising arm of the trustees, they did hire a lawyer um, probably about six months before the beginning of COVID and, you know, everything, all, all the balls got dropped. <laughs> yeah. And so they picked up the ball again um, shortly after, um, you know, probably like mid 2020 and did reach out to town council and have not got a response um, several times. So um, it's in process. And I know that Tim is, is picking the ball back up to okay. get that to completion. I just have one other question. Um, sure. What is in uh, the amount of money that's in the trust at the moment? Um, there's not really a trust. There, there's the trustees. There's the Tilton Fund, which is a um, 501c3. That's a, a separate arm. Uh, what is in that account at the moment? Uh, I don't know. I don't think I know that off the top of my head. Yeah, it's a it's a nonprofit, non tech, so it's it, can a raise, it can raise money for, to the benefit of the library. Is that what it is? Yeah, yeah. So does that go towards cutting out what the town puts towards the funding? I mean, yeah, right. It funds it funds the library. It helps you know. It offsets the, towards, each year. Yeah, it, it, it offsets Salary. the cost. Stuff like yeah, that. pays for salaries, pays for operation. There's, you know, they, they not salary, no, not salary. So it puts money towards it's uh, basically the budget the, each year. It offsets the municipal budget and basically covers things like the collection. I mean, just a portion. 
special projects, um, things like that. Okay. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Right. Sure. I, I think in the past you've used it for some maintenance issues. Yes. Yeah. Um, and that is one of the, re you know, I, agree, I can't agree enough with Matt Russo's comment that, you know, we have made a point of trying to make sure we have maintenance for each um, building that we build new, so. Yeah, I'll have to figure EMS has got it, so. Yeah, so okay. the division of local services here, can the town borrow money to pay a portion of the cost of capital improvements that a library is not owned by the town? The answer is no. Chapter 44, section 7.3. Is that in the information you left us? Yep. Okay, great. Packet, so we'll sir. turn it on to yep. the attorney and appreciate your comments. If I can get an answer, that would be great. Yep, we'll work <laughs> on that for you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Jeff? Can this we, be the last? Thing yes, this is the last one, and we're we're moving on to the warrant because I don't want to be here till midnight. <laughs> I don't blame you. Just just a very quick question, more out of curiosity. I'm hearing about the board of trustees acting as an oversight for the Deerfield Library, whoever owns it, the town, or whatever the case may be. With that board of oversight, are all the members uh, residents of the town of Deerfield? And if not, what's the breakout? Uh, yes, six of the seven are, and one was until about a year ago, but they are appointed, uh, are permanent trustees, so it's it's okay for them to not be a, a Deerfield resident, but they were for 30 years. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. So moving on, do we want to hit every article here? Uh, Everyone's why don't we like, ask, no. <laughs> Why don't we ask if people yeah, have is, any Are there questions? any articles that anybody would like some to talk about but other than the library in the sewer? <laughs> no hands. Nobody online. Um, so oh, no, there is there is somebody oh, um have oh, raised we do hand. have one. Deborah. Hey, good evening. I'm sorry my camera isn't working well That's tonight. Okay. Can you hear me okay though? We can yeah. hear you fine. Okay. My question is about the um, the tax abatement for new pro. Um, I was just interested in hearing more. I've like the rest of us, I've been on this meeting since 6 p.m. and everyone's very concerned about spending money yep. um, and the town's financial situation. And I'm just wondering, this is this is a multinational corporation that's the parent company of new pro. They certainly doesn't seem like they need 322,000 of our tax dollars. So I'm wondering if you all could explain that a little bit more. Sure. Um, anytime an entity decides to come in to a town and spend $18 million, um, you know, our town uh, competes like anybody else. You know, th this had this entity had an, op uh, an opportunity to go down south. They could have been in Connecticut. And I think they were looking at um, North Carolina as well. We're very hesitant to give out tax incentives, but um, but we do when it when it, um, it benefits the town. Um, so, you know, the first, you know, we went through a lot of negotiations, you know, they, they came with a, you know, we want 100% for so many years and, um, and the whole idea of developing that property and getting it back on the tax rolls, a big chunk of it is used by our, our, um, you know, our highway garage, the second um, entity of that property was pilot precision, they did not get a um, a pilot, they applied, but I think it was a little late. And really what we do as a town to support um, getting, you know, all those jobs, hopefully 80 jobs in the end, high paying, good quality jobs in the town of Deerfield is um, to provide an incentive so that they can also get a man, uh, uh, an incentive from the state. So really the large money comes from the state to help, um, help with training and help with, you know, bringing, bringing jobs and manufacturing jobs to to um, one, the United States, and two, Deerfield, for one, um, it's really important. So our our participation is, um, it sounds like a lot, but that's over 10 years. And um, and we, we tied it towards, you know, you have to have so many jobs, you have to, hope, you know, hire people locally. We put a lot of, uh, you have to build out a certain amount. Um, so we put in a lot of caveats that we will, you know, get reports on each year as this goes through as they, you know, build the project and then um, bring the jobs over that they have and then expand um, so that, you know, our, our, our tip goes away or gets reduced if they don't meet those 
requirement. So we think um, it's smart business to get that much work in town. It's very rare that you get a, a manufacturing company, regardless of how big they are or whatever. I mean, these were two local guys who started this and yes, were bought out by a a, a, a larger facility, but they're local entrepreneurs that um, do a very skilled job and it's bringing high tech manufacturing to, to our region, which is, which is worth a ton. So I like, think it's important. Like Trevor said, um, I've, I've been on the TIF recommendation committee for, for mostly we've given local TIFs like to Richardson's Candy Kitchen or Pekarski's or Berkshire Brew, but what this does is trigger the state. It, it is highly important to trigger the state um, uh, tax um, abatement, but also you notice the highest amount is in the first year or two. And, and that's when they're breaking ground and they're, you know, like right now they're, you know, there's no, there's no real tax because there is no real building mm -hmm. and, and how these assessors go through um, and do a valuation based on um, every six months of, or something like that of, of the build out. So by the time you get complete build out from the assessor's point of view, you're already into the TIF two or three years. So it sounds like a lot, but really you're giving seven, right now you're giving 70%. Mm. Uh, we're, we're partway through fiscal year 23. So fiscal year 24 is coming up and there's not a lot out on that lot right now. So yes, they're getting 70%, you know, mm -hmm. rebate, but on how much, not very much, but at least it's on the tax roll. Mm -hmm. So um, it, it sounds excessive, if you just look at that chart, but when you actually do the numbers and, and and the fact that it comes on the tax roll, we have performance, as as Trevor said, performance criteria that they have to meet that ultimately benefit the town. It's a multiplier effect because you got all these people that have expendable money, you know, in town, they'll go to Wolfie's for lunch or Leo's table or whatever, and they'll buy something here in town. Those are the kind of things that, you know, the benefits not really on the numbers on the paper, but hugely benefit the town of Deerfield. Um, yeah, and I think it's helpful to think about this, the exemption. I think it's easier to understand in my mind. I don't know why. Um, in the first year when there's almost nothing there, they're going to get a, they're going to pay 30% of what's there. So say it's $500,000, they're going to pay 30, uh, they're going to be paying 30% of their assessed valuation on $500,000. In year, the next year, it's gonna to go to 40%, then it's gonna be 50% in, in 2026. So they're gonna be paying half of the assessed value of what's there. That's probably when the, if, if this moves forward, that's probably when the plant will be complete. Uh, the following year, they're gonna be paying 60. Then they're gonna be paying 70. And then in the final five years, they're gonna be paying 80% of the assessed value of an $18 million facility. So Car Carolyn's point is correct. It's, they're gonna get the biggest benefit when there's nothing there. Um, so or not yes. much, not much, yeah, don't well, say yeah. that about that. I mean, obviously it's gonna be an assessed valuation on what is physically present yeah. at the time that the, that, that the uh, percentage is allocated to them. So I'm, I'm new to this, this is my first TIF and I'm learning about it, but uh, um, you know, it, it is an important, they're, they're talking about a, a hundred jobs, hundred plus jobs when they're fully, Fully functioning, so, and hopefully, it'll be a good partner for Deerfield for many, many years to come. Yep. So, <laughs> oh, there's someone in the. No, I'm sorry. I've watched people in person. I know it's easier when someone's in person. I'm just going to ask one more follow up question as people sure, in person sure. have been doing. Okay, thank you. So, the what I've read is that it would be 50 more jobs, and so I'm hearing 80. I'm hearing 100. So, I don't know if it's possible to they're, actually. They're hoping to have 80 jobs employed by 20, I think 28. Right, but they're already operating in Deerfield with a certain amount, right? So maybe that's- They're operating in Waitley with 51 employees, though its employees right. will transfer to Deerfield. They have a five-year plan to add another 58 employees. Yep. Okay, thanks, sorry, who's that? Is that Casey? That's yeah. me. Okay, thank you. And then just the other point was when you said that they're owned, Trevor, by a larger, um, facility, I think you said, just clarifying that it's the Orifal group and that's truly a global, they have 
multi- Africa, Asia. It's a multinational corporation. It's not just owned by a larger facility. Yeah. And, Thank and they're, you. And they're yeah. building in Deerfield. Yeah. Yeah. Is yeah. there any, was there anything put into the TIF around them being union jobs? I don't believe they're, they're union jobs. Is there still room to negotiate that? No. No. That, that's, you know, the right to our, organize. That's not our business to yeah. tell them how to run I mean, their shop. The employee's right to organize is not anything to do with the town. And the employees obviously certainly have the right to unionize Absolutely. If, they, if they can unionize. And Sorry, just to clarify, I meant the right to organize written into the TIF. I didn't mean that's what I oh, meant. Oh, right. Yep. No, they definitely I think have that's it. guaranteed by federal law. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we just, we have no. Do you have a no comment? Other. Okay. I, I think she, uh, yeah, she muted again. I think Deborah, she, I think Deborah, are you Deborah, finished? Deborah, uh, Deborah, I'm finished. Thank you all very much. Thank you for your comments. Thank you for let, giving us the opportunity to explain it. Matt Russo, Captain Latham Drive. Um, we had a great presentation by Gordon Oaks years ago who was able to explain to us for every dollar of commercial tax revenue that was collected, I want to say it costs a town somewhere in the low 60s, about 63 cents to provide services. So essentially the town netted 37 cents on that tax dollar from commercial properties to provide services to residential. On the residential side, for every dollar that we collect, I believe at the time it cost a town like a dollar twenty-seven to provide those services. So, if we didn't have the commercial business, it was going to cost the taxpayers that much more money to really cover the services hmm. that needed to cover the town. So, to kind of wrap this thing together, we talked about sewer rates earlier. The sewer is important for that business. That business is important to help offset the services for the residents in the community. The TIF that you're talking about is important because we get more commercial tax revenue on the rolls. The commercial businesses don't send children to school, so they don't need the school services. Typically, many of the other services that are provided by the town, there's much less of that provided to those businesses. And when those businesses are healthy and continue to expand, building permits, building permit revenue, the additional revenue with those folks coming in now granted there probably will also be traffic and the other things that come with it some of that traffic is good especially for the local merchants in downtown who are going to benefit from the folks stopping to get coffee lunch supplies shopping haircuts whatever else is there what you're referring to is the american farmland trust um study in 2003 which is extremely outdated at this point so the services that commercial businesses probably is relatively static about 60 cents but since our budget is 70 percent school related at this point i would say the residential cost to the town is more you know much more closer to dollar 50 or dollar 60 or something like that so absolutely having the the balance of commercial has saved our tax rate can incredibly over the years. And so it is really important to have a, a mix of commercial and, and you know, uh, residential. Sure. Thank you for the comments. Thank, Thank you. you. Any yeah. other articles? We're, we're losing people fast here. Yeah. And they're dwindling. So any, anybody else have any other comments you'd like to hit on anything before town meeting on Monday? All right, moving on. So um, let's see. So then we have got Board of Health. Select um, board I, announcements. Just, I, I just want to encourage everybody this. I had a Homeland Security uh, meeting on Tuesday and the hospital representative um, reported that the hospitals were filling up with flu persons already. So um, please, this is going to be a really bad flu year. We are having a clinic this weekend, October 22nd. 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. The um, signups are on our webpage. Uh, you can get them anywhere, but we also are going to take in walk ins. So please come and get your flu shot and your bivariant. Um, please uh, come and get your um, Omicron uh, shot because um, there are several different um, variants in Europe that. In one week, the first the first week of October, it was zero, and it's already 13% of the cases nationwide for a couple of these strains. And we will have some, because they're Omicron strains, you'll have some protection 
with uh, um, the new COVID. Um, I just want to add on. This is a DPW, yes. So, um, Alex, do you yes, want to just the add DPW. to it? At the DPW. Yeah, at the DPW garage. And if you sign up on the link, just make sure that everyone is aware that you need to have the VAR form, the vaccine administration record form completed um, ahead of time. It's just better for efficiency purposes. You can also pick up physical copies from uh, the our public health nurse, Cindy Majewski. There's also some on the lobby right there in the town hall. And on the way out, you can grab some. Uh, along with some COVID tests. And, uh, uh, and the senior center director, um, Jennifer Remillard, also has some too. So, but if, if when you sign up, you're gonna get a confirmation email and then there's also a link that you can click on where it prints out the VAR form for you to um, fill out. You, I think you have to print it out and, and, and write it out. Maybe you might have the option to fill it in, I'm not quite sure. But if you have any questions or concerns, just email me or Carolyn and Carolyn will help. No, I'm kidding. And I'll help you out and Alex. we'll be all set. <laughs> So. Yeah, you don't want to get paid, Alex. Yeah. <laughs> I don't need any more emails. <laughs> um, but I'm glad to help people because I'm really encouraging people. This is going to be a tough winter. So please thanks, everyone. protect thank you. yourself. Thank you all for coming. Really appreciate it. Thank yeah. you. Um, yeah. What? We, the South County EN, uh, Emergency Dispensing Group is doing it. Yes, we are. Um, with, with Walgreens. Walgreens will be our vaccinators. Okay, so come across the street. Oh, you oh, did. Oh, good. Oh, smart. Both? You got both? Oh, oh yeah, no, gotcha. that, that group challenged. Where yeah. did you go? I mean, where did you get it? Oh, oh, oh no. Oh, I'm yep. sorry. Sorry well, to hear that. Yeah, We've seen you know that. what? We have seen that. You know what? It, to be fair, we're, we're having to, the state is forcing us to work with vendors. And, you know, Alex has been really on top of Walgreens because we had such a bad experience with our VAX bus on September 30th. And it's this, you know, the FERCOG has had no choice in this either. They're using the same VAX bus and they had the same problem as we did. So, but don't worry because we're, we're working uh, tirelessly, you know, uh, just to go ahead and make sure that we can do it ourselves. Uh, the only things that we need at this time is the, um, is the funds in order to order the vaccines come February and March. And that way we can have, um, you know, flu clinics and uh, COVID clinics and whatnot. And um, we don't need to rely heavily on the vendors. So keep it local. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Um, next item is a sewer abatement for 64 uh, Grave Street. Um, so I know that, so we had um, a faulty, we got notified that there was a faulty meter. Um, I talked about this last meeting, um, 98 year old living alone, so does not use a lot, doesn't do laundry, like very little. Her rates have been steady for the last however many years this has been on here, six years. And then it just ballooned up, it like quadrupled up. So, oh, um, so I did a, uh, just an analysis of, and the water department is coming to change the meter and correct it. I think that was the issue. So I don't, I, I think because of, you know, normally it needs to be paid in full before we abate. I don't know if she's done that yet, just because of um, the size. It, well, it's, uh, so the bill was like, uh, here we go. the bill was like 478 and I can't tell um, if this is quite accurate or not, but I was going to abate, uh, change this to 61. I took the average of the last bills to a 6,100 usage. And so it's on the front of my stuff here. So it, was a, it was, should be a $99 bill instead of 300 and, or $460 bill or 360, because you always have the $100 service fee. It was $360 and 56 cents. Trevor, we can't hear you. I'm sorry, I'll talk into the mic. Um, so I took an average of the last steady bills, and then that was about 6,100 uh, in usage. And so that would be about a $99, $99.92 cent bill. You always have the $100 um, usage uh, or connection fee. 
So um, we were going to abate two hundred and seventy eight dollars and thirty one cents. Her total bill would be one ninety nine ninety two. If okay. that math looks right, I'll check with you know Sarah. Um, but that was the amount that I was thinking was accurate, just an average of those last. Um, it kind of fell right in the middle. And then um, I'm fine with that, Trevor. That, that seemed pretty normal because, you know, again, she had a very steady rate going all along. I, I know. I, I, I want to make sure she's relieved that we vote on that and yeah. we can tell her that not to worry. And about generally, this. it needs to be paid ahead of time. So she may need to pay that and then we immediately if, reimburse. If, um, if there's any however issues that with, works. yeah. Yeah, I'll if talk with any, uh, Sarah about yeah. that. Yeah, okay. So can I have a motion to? I, I make a motion that we approve uh, your abatement um, calculations. Okay, okay. Thank I'll, you. I'll second it with, uh, yeah. Yeah, any any further discussion? All those in favor? Tim Hilchey, aye. Trevor McDaniel, aye. Carolyn Ness, aye. Thank you very much, I will deal with that. There's also a letter of support in here. I, I may be jumping around because it's almost nine yep. o'clock. So um, there's a letter of support for South County Efficiency and Regionalization grant application. Um, so this is, um, Casey, do, are, are you on and do you wanna nail this down a little bit? Um, this is for uh, for over a decade, town of Deerfield, Waitley, and Sunderland have collaborated to provide senior services for each town, senior populations through the South County Senior Center. Uh, the building was physically closed. Um, let's see. So a portion of the, these are a portion. We're looking for grants. I assume we're reaching the grant. This is the um, through the community compact um, cabinet, community compact grant. So I think this is a letter of support, and uh, we would be using the money for HVAC and I think redoing that building. So that's we're requesting. Um, we urge you to award the fully requested 200,000 to move forward this effort. So somebody who knows more than this could speak, more than me about this could speak on this, but uh, nobody's jumping. This is is Denise Mason available? Is this the, something this Denise is, worked on? I, I know Denise, um, there are yes, several I'm here. compact Hey there. Oh, there. Hi. Hey, Denise. Yeah, I'll keep it on mute. I'll keep it, my video off. Yeah, we, um, Wait, can you run up by me again with one for the community compact? Oh, this is the efficiency and regionalization. Okay, yes. that is for the um, for the church, and Got we it. are planning on having that as a transitional place for senior services, and we can get a grant up to two hundred thousand dollars. And we did ask uh, wait both Waitley and Sunderland for letters of support. I know we did get one from Tom Feidenkevitz. And I believe the other one was to come from Waitley. So are you saying that we didn't yep. receive that one? Yes, we're, um, we're I would make a motion. I would make a motion Perfect. to, to um, support this letter of uh, requ you know, requesting um, regionalization and compact. Great for the church. Church project. Uh, and I'll second it. Any further yeah. discussion? All those in favor? Tim Hilchey, aye. Trevor McDaniel, aye. Carolyn Ness, aye. Great. So Great. Thank okay. You very much, Denise. I appreciate you jumping on. Oh, sure. Time. Yeah. And if you can uh, relay that information to Casey, because we'll need that as we submit the grant. Absolutely. Yep. Thank you. And and also a letter of support, obviously, from you guys. Um, I just have, um, I want to make sure we vote on the ARPA capital DPW overage HVAC. Yeah, I would, I would like to just pay this right out of ARPA. Um, yes, um, it uh, makes sense. It, the money initially, I, I was on the capital committee. We we had an estimate of ten thousand. It that, turns uh, out the thirteen. Or something, to, right? Yeah, and yeah. that that is definitely COVID impacted cost yep. of equipment. It was installed and done, and it, it's an overage. So I would um, Use the encourage I think the, that's what the we we've just well. voted on capital improvement committee to um, approve the overage, and we updated our capital spreadsheet. So okay. I would urge us, and I would make the motion to approve Support this that. overage. And I'll second it. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Tim Hilchey, aye. Trevor McDaniel, aye. Carolyn Ness, aye. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Yes. Uh, let's see. So that's done. Um, so we did the South County Senior Center. Um, the uh, the collective bargaining agreement for approval. I don't know if Casey has that 
ready to go or you just need a vote? I mean, we knew what it was going to be anyways. Do you, did you need us to do anything on that, Casey? Say that again. Matt was talking to me for a minute. <laughs> okay. He apologizes. Say, not a problem at all. Um, uh, so the, the uh, highway collective bargaining agreement for approval. Do, do so you... the collective bar, there's one date change that has to happen in the duration on page 21. I printed them up. Um, unfortunately, Kate wasn't able to make that change today. What I would request the board do. So the settle, it, the unions ratified. Okay. I would suggest the board um, vote to approve the contract pending the duration period. So there's okay. there's the 20 to 21 or the 21 to 22 period, and then there's 22 to 25. Okay. So there's two separate contracts, but those duration dates need to be corrected. I've done it, but I want Kate to make sure I did it right. That's fine. That's fine. So I'll make a motion to approve um, this agreement pending the uh, the date change. Yep. Um, I will second that. All those in favor? Tim Hilchey, aye. Trevor McDaniel, aye. Carolyn Ness, aye. Thank you, Casey, Kevin. Thank Iway, you. Everybody that's worked, Kate, everybody that's worked on that. I know it's been a long haul. and It's been a haul. <laughs> really grateful to have, um, have that settled and um, appreciate all the work everybody did on that. So thank you. Cool. Um, the 1888 design services contract for review. We still don't have the contract. Oh, Trevor, I'm waiting. Dan... Dan and I are emailing each other, Dan Pallotta. That's fine. The community planning solar project scope of work, is that something we need to deal with tonight? No, I think we're going to need to put that off. We also can put off the South County Senior Center Regionalization and Efficiency oh, we, Support we letter. Signed we signed that. We approved it and signed it. You didn't even have it. <laughs> yeah, I got it right here. We all signed. I even read it. You read it? I read it. Well, we can put it off. It's not due till the seventh. Well, we already oh. did it, so we're done. Don't put off what you don't can, what you've what already you signed. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> don't spaz um, out Denise. She's got this already done. Yeah, we're all done. done. Um so do, and the, the job description policies for that we put off until the next meeting. Okay, for the time. But I really want to make a point here. Um and I know everybody wants to leave, but frankly, we should advise people what's on the warrant because there were a lot of questions that happened in the first two hours of this meeting that that are actually the information is available. Um, a question of debt excluded prop two and a half vote that's directly in the warrant, but people may not understand some of the nuances of the first articles. Casey, we're all set. We already went over the warrant. Everybody, we asked their questions. Everybody's done. They're gone. We're done. We're, we're, we're all set. Over it. So, um, so yeah. I the just, only thing we do need to figure out though is a, a couple of questions for Lisa, and I'll talk to you after the meeting. About that. I've already sent a couple questions to her. Okay, great. But everybody else is good with the, with the warrant. So um, if not, we'll hear about it Monday. <laughs> yeah. Uh, let's see. And the telecommuting policy we're holding off on, so we have no appointments, resignations. Did we finish? Well, there were there were, um, the 2023 we um, sewer rate. I, oh. I think we need to put that off. I, yeah, I, I, I really just wanted to start talking about that between us or just bring it to your attention that we have obviously we have a rate hearing coming up. We have to decide on a rate. We're looking at you know what the operational is for the sewer and then what other projects we're going to work on we, the following can year. we get um the last you know just just a presentation you know a chart of what the rates were you know and the mm -hmm. increases for the last five years yeah basically what i did was Probably. i sent an email to casey requesting that we have um what what the rate process and what the rates were pre the um, pre-project mm -hmm. and what they have been through the years as the projects progressed just yeah, so we have that. an understanding because I'm, I'm new to this and i really yeah, yeah, need to be educated and I, I think it's my due diligence yeah that, for sure uh, and did you get the uh proposed sheet i have yes. the proposed sheet but i'm, I'm okay. not prepared to talk about it at this meeting that's fine yeah, yeah we got we got time to do that so well, i just um, wanted to, yeah i just wanted to go over it but I just wanted you guys seeing that and yeah, start working no, on no, your I questions, questions and ideas. Yeah. Yep. We have questions. 
Okie dokie. So anything else? No. Casey, oh, minutes. A... Oh, October let's do 12th. the minutes. I don't want to ever forgive those. Let yeah, forget October those. 12th, um, January 10th. Yeah, and I got to go through them real quick. January I have 15th, not the 29th, July 29th, this is, this and is August 12th. January 12th, 2020. 2020. Yeah. Yes. August 12th, 2020. Right. Yep. Okay. These are old. So uh, I have we'll not... have to do August. Let's do October 12th, 2022 separately from the 2020s. Okay. So yeah, no why don't mix... we do why don't you I haven't read any of these yet. So because I've been buried. Do you want to just do them next week? Yeah, we can put them off till next week. Are we meeting next week? No. Uh, well, no. You not not, not on Wednesday. Uh, I don't okay. think we are. I think the next one is November too. Let me just are, are we scheduled for a meeting, um, that, Casey, um, before the town meeting? No. Okay. Say that again. Are we scheduled for a select board meeting before the town meeting? Friday. We are going to post for you for six thirty or for five thirty. Sorry, right. um, we'll post for CIPC and we'll post for finance just in case. Yep. In case decisions have to be made on the floor. Okay. So um, I just want to verify that maybe I've got something in my calendar incorrectly. I have a 430 finance committee select board on Friday. So what we did was we posted yep. out of an abundance of caution for the select board in case a quorum of members attends. You okay. guys don't have to show up, but we posted for it. Finance is meeting. Yeah, yeah, yep. yeah. Okay, good. Okay. And then we I'm going to set up for the meeting. clinic. I'm going to set up for the clinic on, on Friday afternoon. So I was going to, as soon as I was done, I was going to come over for the five four thirty. So thank you, Casey, for posting it just in case. Okay. I don't know if we want to meet in person or not, but, and if I get done, I might just go home and do zoom, but I, I, I felt like I wanted to participate. Okay. So that was why I asked Casey to, to post it. In fine. case somebody yeah, no, else. In case we want to talk. Yeah, right. that sounds fine. Yep. Well, we could, um, I mean, we could just always, you know, have a chance to read the minutes and do them then. I mean, yeah. whatever. Uh, well, yeah. Something like that. If there's at least two of us, we could vote yeah. them. Yeah. I don't or, think or Tim. Or Monday before the meeting. I don't know. It doesn't, it's not critical, but. Uh, you could put them off until the next meeting. Okay. Um, oh, here's the. But reason. we've been trying to stick to a schedule. So if you're not prepared to vote them, we can put them off to the next meeting. Alex is here so he can hear us talking about that. I think we could we could read them. You don't need to reprint them for our packet next time. I right. don't think. Yeah, save some paper. And and don't and don't. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm thinking so far. But for the as we talk later. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Rates. Yeah. Um, and then. Uh, is there anything is that in the packet or not? That is in the packet. It's because my packet's all out of whack. <laughs> it, you should find you should right there. there yep, you got it. Um, and then okay, so that's that's I just wonder if there was anything else. We'll deal that later. There's nothing else, right? Is there mail that was we had to hit on or well actually I didn't know where you were gonna be next Wednesday because I might have to if if you're gonna be around. I mean, our own, I'm not saying Tim isn't interested too, but um, someone was wanted to do the, you know, the electric charging, potentially do a, you know a project, mm -hmm. and so I I didn't, I'm not 100% interested. I mean, I am interested, but <laughs> it's like one more thing. So it you is, had talked about it, and so I I didn't know the rates were, and stuff like that. Or, no, or just no, having just ha having oh. a project here in town. This is you know, oh, off, I know what off, you're talking about. Yes, off yes, 91. yes, yes. So yeah, I didn't know if you were going to be available at all next Wednesday or what your schedule was. Um, Depending on the time of day, if it's later in the day, I can be. Okay, on the road so for, for maybe in the afternoon. Mm -hmm. If we if we if we did sort of four o'clock ish. Yeah. Would you be back in town? I would be. I should be. Okay, Casey, could you um, just uh, post for four o'clock next Wednesday? Um, like four o'clock for the select board. Um, it, it's about um, a charging charging station project. A charging station project. Yeah. yeah just. So I need to tell you what you need to do if the library passes at town meeting. 
Oh. By by before the end of next week, y'all have to have a meeting and vote a warrant to call a special okay. election. Well, then why Let's don't do it you the just, 26 then. Just, just put it well, that's what I was going to suggest, but I didn't know what time, and I hadn't had a chance to really ask because well, there was so much activity know. at the beginning of the meeting. Well, is Tim available? Any at chance we can do it before six? Yeah. Yes. I mean, no, we're saying yeah. Yeah. four o'clock. Yeah. Four o'clock is fine with me. Yep. Four o'clock. Okay. Yeah. And so, I'm out of so, here by 5.30. No yeah. worries. Yeah, give us, give us a shut-off time, Tim. Thank you. All right. All right. So <laughs> we're going to do a select board. The birds. We're mm -hmm. going to do a select board at 4 o'clock to do, if we have to address the library stuff, and then also the charging station. So what's the charging station question? Can you call me and give me the offline outline? Yep. Yes. Carolyn, do thank you. Do that. I, I, don't, Perfect. I don't really know. Offline. I mean, it's just, yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you. <laughs> Somebody right. called me. We're gonna. I'm gonna. And um, I'm trying to pan it. I'm not stuff. interested. I'm trying to give it to Trevor. That's <laughs> why I'm stuff. like. <laughs> um, anybody uh, got anything else that should be talked about before no. we go? No. no. Thank I you, everybody I online. I really appreciate uh, yeah. you hanging out with us, and thanks for everybody who was here tonight. Yeah. Yes. Thank you, Julie, thank you everybody. Work. Julie, thank you, Chris, for coming. You're always. amazing to really help. Really appreciate it. So explain stuff. Julie is amazing. And have a yes. motion to adjourn. I will I'll make, make that, that motion. motion. I'll those, second that motion. All those in favor? Tim Hilchi, aye. Trevor McDaniel, aye. Carolyn S. I. Thank you very much.